need to look at some other areas of the labor market, not just the payroll number. The slowdown in the labor market would not be a great thing because that tends to not be something that turns very quickly. I think markets are now laser focused on this job section. The labor market is balanced. Inflation readings have come down. I think the biggest risk is not necessarily inflation picking up. That could be part of it but more of a melt up in markets. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. Bloomberg Surveillance starts right now. Check out this price action heading back towards all-time highs on the S&P 500, up by eight-tenths of 1% on the NASDAQ. Thank you, Micron. We'll talk about that name a little bit later. That name is up big time. On NASDAQ 100 futures right now, up by 1.36%. We should also say thank you, China. Alibaba in the pre-market. Check out those stocks. Look at the likes of Baidu, JD.com, major moves as China adds to the stimulus package from earlier in the week, the promise of fiscal support out of the world's second largest economy. Once thought of as welfareism, now suddenly handouts, essentially giving money ahead of the national holiday in China to individuals that might need it. This to me uh, really highlights how much of a reversal this administration has had in China as they now try to support a market uh, ahead of what? And that I think is a big question. Why now are they unleashing what increasingly is looking like a bazooka? It's a great question to ask why now, because usually when they come out and they talk about the economy at this gathering, it's April, July, or December. We are in September. What do they know that they're so concerned about? They also came out saying they want to stop the decline, the property market. The property market lost, what, nearly $20 trillion already? Why now? So we got some big moves in the stock market. Alibaba rallying in commodities, base metals, Perkin Gump at foreign exchange, the Aussie outperforming. All of that coming together quite nicely ahead of two big data points later. A speech from New York Fed President John Williams, one, and jobless claims, 8.30 Eastern time. Powell is in the mix as well, but these are pre-recorded remarks, right? I'm not sure how much weight we should put on that a little bit later. I had a similar feeling at the uh, Treasury meeting that they have, and we do hear, though, from John Williams, also from Bar Cook, Kashkari, Kugler, and Bellman. Uh, so we have a bunch, as well as uh, Collins. The, all of this is coming at a time where people want to understand what the reaction function is from a Federal Reserve. Jobless claims, to me, will be a really interesting moment because because so far, if it's weak, but not that weak, is viewed as sort of positive because that gives the Fed impetus to maybe go 50 basis points in November. At what point do people start to get worried again, especially at a time where you're getting stimulus and rate cuts around the world? So that's sort of uh, the balance right now in markets. 223,000 is the estimate for jobless claims the previous week, 219. If you want to talk weak, look at this call coming out of City and Andrew Honhorst. 70K. We project a soft 70K in new jobs in next week's payrolls report for the month of September. Can you imagine if we print 70,000 a week tomorrow? Well, that could be negative in actual terms. And I think that this is the key, because if you have 70,000 and then you subtract 60,000, which is what the revisions will do at least, and then you talk about uh, the potential for government jobs and other types of uh, sort of noisy data points that people strip out, you're talking about actual job contraction. I think that's the reason why that team is looking for a hard landing and looking for something more recessionary coming out of the labor market. This is the exact point. The revisions, every single number you see, everyone in the market basically slices off 60K when it comes to those jobs. So how weak would a number like 70K print actually be? We've said it repeatedly on this program, the difference between being bullish and bearish right now on the U.S. equity market is your view on the jobs market in America. Equity futures on the S&P with a lift here uh, by 0.8%, snapping back from yesterday's very, very mild losses. In the bond market, yields actually a little bit lower. Lisa, we're down two basis points, 376.58. Yeah, and this comes ahead of the seven-year auction, but really there's a feeling that if the Fed really does cut rates significantly, it's gonna bring down yields across the board. You have to also imagine we have a race to the bottom around the world suddenly when it comes to interest rates. Maybe not a race to the bottom, maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you have a global rate cutting cycle. And the, uh, what that does to yields globally has become uh, more and more apparent, especially here in the U.S. Evan Brown of UBS on the program a little bit later. He thinks we should be pricing out the recession, not pricing in the recession, based on the things that you described this morning. Yeah, how much of a game changer is what we're seeing over in China? Not just uh, for China, but also from Europe and on the margins for the U.S. You start to wonder how this sort of plays out if you do have all of this accommodation coming through the pike. Evan Brown coming up a little bit later. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with George Concarvis of MUFG after absolutely nailing the Fed's 50 basis point move last week. Bloomberg's Jemana Basechi as allies look to prevent a wider war in the Middle East. And Robert Sarkin of City on the stimulus effort 
out of China. We begin this hour with stocks pushing back towards record highs on the promise of further rate cuts in America and fiscal stimulus in China. George Concarvis of MUFG writing, market participants need to stop to think about why central banks are cutting to begin with. If the economy cannot handle the higher rates backdrop, then conditions are not that strong to maintain earnings estimates. George joins us now for more. George, welcome to the programme. And first of all, sir, congratulations on absolutely nailing that 50 basis point call at the Federal Reserve. Before we go deeper into what's happening worldwide, just help us understand what guided you towards you, you towards the correct call last week and what you're expecting on November 7th. Look, the, uh, the, the totality of data, and that's been a key word that Chair Powell mentioned all throughout the summer, it's, it's the totality of the jobs market. And that's why I know we're going to watch the weekly claims it probably won't really capture the underlying weakness that's, that's that's out there. There is downside risk for this September NFP, but it's really the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate, once it starts to trend, it doesn't stop trending. And I think that you know, the 4.4 percent estimates that the you know the Fed has in their kind of projections for the summary of economic projections, it's wishful thinking that they have to kind of give a, a, a an upper level in their minds. But we can get there next week, right? So I think um, I think it's the unemployment rate. They've realized that the data. Uh, was revising to the downside, and then we got that big QCEW revisions. That's what you know kept us with the 50 big uh, uh, cut for the first cut, and it's also why we probably get another one at the at the November meeting as well. So, George, walk us through what you expect from payrolls a week tomorrow. City's Andrew Honhorst in a similar camp to you, looking for 70k. I can't imagine what the fallout in the market would look like if we printed a 70. Lisa and I were just talking about that. What's the number that you're looking for with the team? Yeah, so look, we're we're in that kind of sub one hundred thousand too. I mean, we don't actually forecast the specific numbers, but if you take you know the confluence of discounting what the revisions might be, but also the birth death models actually swings to kind of a negative for September. I mean, be really, if we get like a close to zero or a negative number, then that's even you know lights out, right? So I, I think um, I'm really focused more on the unemployment rate. If it takes back up to four point three. I mean, I think that's going to matter more than. Is it this, you know, just the headline, but you know, a sub 100,000 will get the markets moving to the downside. This to me is really the interesting point. You said the market's moving to the downside. Have we reached the point where larger rate cuts getting priced in by the market will be treated as a negative for equities? Exactly, because I mean, the first cut, um, generous 50 basis point cut, is viewed as accommodation. Uh, the next 50 bit cut, it's going to be a realization that the actual economy is not as strong and therefore it's going to be. At a minimum, bumpy, and the Fed is trying to, you know, foam the runways that I mentioned many times before. They're going to try to soft land. There's no guarantee that they're going to be able to, to achieve that. Do we have any sense of uh, what exactly the rate cuts are doing at this point? In other words, how quickly they're going to get implemented in the real economy at a time where there's still a lot of questions about what the rate hikes did to actually slow down inflation? Yeah, look, this is the classical you know, dilemma of the lead, you know, the, the long and variable lags and. You know, which one's going to offset the other? I mean, these large cuts start to unwind what you know, has been a persistently too high, in my opinion, uh, rate complex. The problem, though, is that the, the interest rate curve has eased for the last uh, basically 10 months. Uh, we've had you know, basically this time last year, we had the 10 year at 5 percent and we're sub 4 percent. The bond market has already eased financial conditions and now the Fed has to follow through. And if they, if they take long to follow through, then it's going to you know, further tighten financial conditions, even though the Fed is cutting. George, to Lisa's point, are we already seeing it in the real economy in the sense that the mortgage data shows people are already lining up to try to refinance on their homes? Look, I mean, I think that's you know, a prudent thing to do. And I think that uh, those that uh, obviously uh, uh, were uh, became homeowners in the last year and a half at higher rates, uh, they're going to take this opportunity to kind of rethink, you know, is this the right level of rates? You can ostensibly have a situation where the 10 year trades between 350, 425. I think we've lost that connection with George Concarvis there of the MUFG looking for another 50 basis point rate cut from the Federal Reserve on November 7th after absolutely nailing the call on September 18th for the Fed to go 50. Deutsche Bank's got an interesting call on this as well. They think the call to go the next 50 to 100 basis points from the Federal Reserve is relatively straightforward. This came from Francis Yarrett. I'll share the quote with you. Here it is. The 25 versus 50 basis point debate was not really about NFP. The case for 50 rests on policy rates being comfortably above a conservative upper bound of neutral of say 425 front loading the first 75 to 100 basis points of rate cuts is actually relatively easy the view from deutsche bank 
Austin Goolsbee would agree. I think a lot of other people would agree. Uh, maybe Mickey Bowman wouldn't, at least uh, verbally, out loud. But I think a lot of people say that that's the case. That you could probably get away with making outsized cuts without igniting some kind of broader market fear, at least at the outset. At what point do, do you trigger something else? And I think that that's the key, especially for people say, how much more can you price in in terms of accommodation for this market before it becomes a problem? If we're pricing in 50 because we just printed 70, I don't think this market's going to like what they see at all. We keep reflecting on this, the 70 from City's Andrew Honhorst. The median estimate so far in our survey is something closer to 140. 70, we'd be talking about August 5th all over again. Yeah, you know, I don't think that it's easy to talk about the rate market. And I do have sympathy with this idea that maybe this equity market is getting more divorced from the rate market because it's unclear how much accommodation it's actually providing. And if it actually needs to provide accommodation, then we have a problem. And so I think that increasingly for equities and for risk assets, they're looking to the economic data and the earnings. And they're kind of looking beyond the 25 to 50 unless it's having a, some kind of signal about the macroeconomic backdrop. Next up for this market, jobless claims 8.30 Eastern time. Going into that, a lift on the equity market up by three quarters of 1% on the S&P 500 with an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg brief. Here's Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. People familiar telling us here at Bloomberg that New York City Mayor Eric Adams has been indicted in a federal corruption probe. A source says the indictment is sealed and it's not yet clear what charges Adams may face. This makes Adams the first sitting mayor of New York City to be charged with a federal crime. In a statement, Adams saying, quote, I always knew that if I stood my ground for New Yorkers, that I would be a target. If I am charged, I am innocent and I will fight this. Meanwhile, Donald Trump is calling on Apple to help investigators access the phones of the two men accused of plotting assassination attempts on his life. The former president said the FBI had been unable to access three potentially foreign-based apps on the phone of Thomas Matthew Crooks, the Pennsylvania man who shot at Trump during a rally back in July. For years, Apple has resisted requests from law enforcement to build a backdoor that would allow authorities to access a device without a user's password. And Meta has debuted its first pair of augmented reality glasses called Orion. The lenses can display text, messages, or, and, or video onto the user's field of vision. An accompanying wristband also allows wearers to click or scroll on the display using just their hands. But you can't get your hands on them just yet. They are prototypes that aren't for sale, but will be used internally at Meta for testing and improving the product. That's Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Let's just roll that video again. Is that Ed Ladlow modeling the hardware coming out of Meta? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and talking about the way he scrolls with his fingers, going like this, rocking back and forth. It felt like he had an out-of-body experience think, when we caught up with him yesterday. I think he did. He said it was really uh, revolutionary. It kind of changed his perception of the world. I just wonder what we're all going to look like if we have glasses on and we're kind of rocking back and forth and making weird hand motions. Ed is calling it the most profound technology experience he's had in his, quote, brief career. This is not the future I want to be a part of. <laughs> Up next on the program, Kamala Harris, the capitalist. Look, I'm a capitalist. I believe in free and fair markets. We will prioritize investments for strengthening factory towns. I understand the pressures of making ends meet. That conversation just around the corner, plus the latest on New York City Mayor Eric Adams. That's all still to come from New York this morning. Good morning. Micron up in the pre-market by 15%, giving this equity market a big lift, particularly on the Nasdaq. On the S&P 500, up by a little more than three quarters of 1%. Thank you, China. Unleashing stimulus earlier in the week, and now the promise, the promise of fiscal support, and also saying things like, we're not going to let housing prices go down from here. I'm not sure how they're going to do that, but... That's the goal. To me, uh, this seems like a sea change in terms of rhetoric, let alone just the actual programs. The idea that they're going to actually give stimulus payments to individual homes at a time when Xi Jinping previously had rejected this as welfareism and a sign of the uh, of, of the seeds of evil of a capitalist society, a society of the West, and this is how they're kind of trying to stimulate demand, to me, highlights just how much there's been a real tone shift in China. I agree. A big shift this week. We'll catch up with Rob of Sokin of City later this hour on this story. Under surveillance this morning, Kamala Harris, the capitalist. Look, I am a capitalist. I believe 
in free and fair markets. We will prioritize investments for strengthening factory towns, offering tax credits for expanding good union jobs in steel and iron and manufacturing communities. I will make the startup deduction 10 times richer and we will raise it from $5,000 to $50,000. I understand the pressures of making ends meet. I grew up in a middle class family. Here's the latest this morning. Kamala Harris pitching herself as a pro-Labour capitalist during a stop in the key swing state of Pennsylvania. Harris pledging to deliver a new tax credit for manufacturing union jobs. Her latest plan also calling for incentives for the creation of AI data centres and support for the semiconductor industry. Joining us now from the nation's capital, Bloomberg's Jack Fitzpatrick. Jack, we had an 82-page document out of the campaign yesterday on the economic plans. Have we got the answers to all our questions? I don't think we have the answers to all our questions, but we're getting more answers, more specific proposals from Kamala Harris, uh, who's having a, a bit of an easier time casting herself as a, a capitalist this year uh, in the, the contrast to former President Trump calling for uh, you know, an across-the-board 10% tariff, as well as in a year where she didn't have to run in a, a Democratic primary and stand out with further and further left-leaning ideas like Medicare for All. Uh, so the, the tax proposal uh, details seem to be getting there. There are some policy areas where she hasn't uh, provided a ton of detail that evidently isn't a huge part of her legislative agenda. Uh, but when it comes to especially taxes and spending, which is where she's going to be forced to do work in the first two years if she is president, there's a fairly good amount of detail now, uh, especially for someone who entered the race as an actual candidate just uh, a couple months ago. Jack, let's talk about tariffs, though, because that's something she can work on on day one. And she supported President Biden on keeping the Trump era tariffs in place. So what's the difference between these two proposals? Well, the, you know, she was pressed on that in the interview after her speech yesterday and basically said she's going to be thoughtful about it. She didn't offer a ton of details on uh, where she might break with the Biden administration on tariffs in particular. That's why I say it's a bit easier for her to uh, thread this needle and say she's a, a pro-labor capitalist uh, with a contrast to a broad proposal by Trump saying let's do 10 percent on every good imported in to the country. Uh, so that's one area where there's not a massive amount of detail, uh, and she hasn't been pressed on this a ton to say exactly where would you differ from President Biden, how strongly would you differ from the first uh, Trump administration, but at least in what they're specifically proposing proactively, there's a fairly uh, clear contrast between Harris and Trump. We got the 82-page report. We got a speech. We got an interview with MSNBC. She spoke specifically about the U.S. steel uh, in Nepal. Uh, potential tie-up. And I thought that this was particularly interesting just as a view into any kind of potential national security versus jobs. She said this, an American company manufacturing that steel for those new industries is going to be critically important, not only in terms of our economy, but also in the context of national security, that keeping it domestic, U.S. steel, is more important than keeping all of the jobs. Jack, what do you make of that? Yeah, you know, she she brought the U.S. steel conversation back into a broader conversation uh, that the Biden administration has tried to focus on, on steel, on domestic production of semiconductors, basically saying we want production and ownership, American ownership of some of the most important things to our economy for national security reasons. I, I, I'm interested to see what the polls show going forward on how that argument plays in Pennsylvania, where this is a tricky issue because some of the promises made by Nippon Steel were for major investment in Pennsylvania. Uh, then again, if you make a little bit of a protectionist argument, uh, if you emphasize U.S. investment and U.S. ownership, uh, I'm not sure necessarily that Pennsylvania voters will see her as uh, destroying a massive number of jobs. But it's a, it's a message she's got to convey carefully, especially in a state like Pennsylvania, which clearly she understands uh, by doing the speech in the following interview there. Hey, Jack, appreciate it. Jack Fitzpatrick down in Washington, D.C. I'm so pleased you went to that quote. How important was that last line? 
Honestly, the fact that a U.S. deal keeping it domestic is most important over keeping all the jobs at a time where this is a delicate dance and people are talking about the labor market as being essential to a lot of these uh, potential economic plans. We'll return to that story a little bit later on this hour. Some breaking news here in New York City in the past 24 hours. Sources familiar with the matter telling Bloomberg New York City Mayor Eric Adams has been indicted following a federal corruption investigation. Bloomberg's Laura Nahimas joins us now for more. Laura, let's just start with what we know and then we can get sort of into the realm of speculation a little bit deeper in a moment. What do we know so far? Well, we know that um, sometime today, federal prosecutors are likely expected to reveal charges against uh, Eric Adams, uh, the 110th mayor of New York City, um, as a result of, of one of the corruption probes that's been going on into his administration um, for, for months now. Um, we don't know what exactly the charges will entail or, or how many people will be charged or if it's just the mayor himself. Um, but we do expect charges to be unveiled today from the Southern District of New York U.S. Attorney Damian Williams. Laura, can you tell us about the investigations that are currently ongoing now by the Manhattan U.S. Attorney's Office? Yes. Uh, so this is unusual in the sense that there is more than one uh, that we know of. We know of at least three emanating from the Southern District U.S. Attorney's Office um, and an additional one that was coming from the Eastern District U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, the first, uh, which came into view uh, in November of last year, centered on potential campaign finance violations from the mayor's 2021 campaign, a successful campaign, and was looking at whether or not uh, donors with connections to Turkey were giving to the mayor potentially in exchange for favorable action on, on things they cared about. That's the first one. The second one and the third one both became more visible in recent weeks after federal agents issued a, a flurry of subpoenas and conducted a bunch of searches and seizures at the homes of very senior Adams administration aides. Uh, the second investigation appeared to center on the now former police commissioner and his twin brother. Um, the former police commissioner, Edward Caban, has since resigned um, after his phone and, and home were searched. Um, and the third investigation centered on or appeared to include uh, several other top aides to the mayor, including a pair of brothers who have incredibly powerful seats in city government. One, David Banks, the New York City Schools Chancellor, who earlier this week announced his plans to retire at the end of the year, this calendar year, in the middle of the school year. And Philip Banks, uh, Adams's deputy mayor for public safety. Laura, we've got to leave it there. Appreciate your reporting. Any updates through this morning, of course, jump back on and share them with us. Laura Lahima's there of Bloomberg on the latest. This from the New York Times. Laura mentioned one of these investigations. This has been widely reported on now for the best part of 12 months. Whether the mayor pressured the city fire department officials to approve permits for a Turkish consulate building despite safety concerns. We've been talking about this for a while especially at a time where a lot of people have been indicted or subpoenaed around him in his orbit. We've seen phones searched, et cetera. The fact that I find most interesting is that I haven't heard anyone come out in support of him, other Democrats, other leadership. In fact, we've had a number of people distance themselves from him. And I wonder where he gets support and where he doesn't. How many people really join that chorus? That's a great question, because we heard from Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. But where is the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer? the senator from New York, where is Hakeem Jeffries, the House uh, leader on the Democratic side, and also, of course, Governor Hochul, because she is the one that can actually force him to resign after this indictment is unsealed. Not much support anywhere in the party right now. Up next on the program, Bloomberg's Jumana Bissetchi on the prospects of a truce between Hezbollah and Israel. The conversation up next. You're watching Bloomberg TV.
snapping a two-day winning streak in yesterday's session on the S&P 500. If you're waking up this morning, forget yesterday, up eight tenths of 1% this morning, up 1.4% on the NASDAQ 100. The outlook for Micron, really decent. The stock is up in a big way in the pre-market, but there's more news than just that this morning. Switch up the board and get to some of the single names out of China, listed here in America, the ADRs. Alibaba up by more than 6%, Baidu up by more than 5%, JD.com up by 8.5%. It's a big rally for the China-related names once again. It feels as if China Chinese authorities came out, rate cuts, a little bit more, and now they're saying, do you hear us now? We're actually gonna deliver direct payments to homes that need it ahead of a national holiday. You want domestic spending, you want consumption, here you go, because we have a problem and we want to get ahead of it. This is a new tone. People have been waiting for this for a long time. We can ask why now. Either way, people are celebrating it across worldwide markets. There is still a deep reservoir of doubt. I think you can feel it. And we've felt it all week. We've heard it from guests who don't believe they're willing to really go in this direction. This is a hint. I still think there's a lot of doubters out there this morning. Otherwise, you'd see base metals up in a much bigger way. I think you'd see even bigger moves in some of the China-related names, even bigger rallies in Europe. Is this the beginning of something bigger? That's the conversation we've got to have this morning. Jay Pulaski is sitting there saying, yes, I've been telling you this. Evan Brown's going to come on. Yes, I've been telling you this. You've got people who've been the believers who've been saying we probably have a trough and they're coming in now. You're right. There still are doubters just simply because it seems to fly in the face of a lot of the ethics and the uh, rhetoric that we've heard from this administration. If we have a better understanding of why now, what they're trying to get ahead of and how committed they are to actually prioritizing business over ideology, then maybe we'll hit people have a better sense of how much they can buy into this. Yeah, well said. Gains of more than 1% across the continent on a range of benchmarks in Europe and beyond. Let's switch to the board, turn the page and get to the bond market story. The two-year yield looks like this, 355.31. We've got a ton of Fed speak for you throughout this morning into this afternoon. Chairman Powell is on deck, but it's some pre-recorded opening remarks. So we're not sure whether it's going to be newsworthy or not. You'll also hear from the New York Fed President, John Williams. You'll get another dose of Chairman Powell next week at the NAIB conference, I believe, as well, Bramo. So if you don't get those comments this week, you will get them next week. What are you listening for? I mean, I'm, I'm actually curious because I've got a couple of things that I'm listening to, but what are you listening for? Does he sound like Goolsby and Deutsche Bank? Does he make out that really the decision to go from here to somewhere close to three isn't that great because we're restrictive all the way down to neutral? Is the next 100 basis points an easy call? That's what I want to try and gauge. I don't think he's going to use the same language as Goolsby, the same language as Deutsche Bank, but he gives you a little hint that that's where things are at, that's how he's thinking about interest rates, then okay, all systems go. We're going to get another big move. If I were going to do forensics analysis of the entirety of Fed speak, I would take a look at his progression, whether he's more on the side of Austin Goolsby, and then I would compare the Fed speakers to their prior speeches before that meeting to understand Jay Powell's sway over them in terms of making them more dovish. So there's some sort of interesting dynamics power-wise on the committee that I'm interested in. What happened in that room? I mean, I've been trying to get a sense. In that two-day meeting last I know, week. Come on. I know. Do you want to know? I think other I, people want to know, too. Know. Please but write in if you would like to, to join me. Mike McKee would say, wait for the transcript, which oh. is years away. Oh, come on. Is that transcript actually accurate? Or is it just basically like a message for the market? Oh, are you the doubting the transcripts coming well, I mean, from the Federal Reserve? <laughs> okay, Bramma, how dare carry you? On. The 10 year, 377, <laughs> 53. Started the quarter at about 450. So we've had quite a big move lower in yield. And over the last week or so, things have stalled out. Yields have started to climb once again. And the auction's coming into sharper focus later on this afternoon. The seven-year auction, I think, will be interesting, just simply because duration seems to have more of an issue being digested in the market. That said, the five-year and the two-year so, so far this week have been completely solid. And that demand for bonds and the demand for yield continues to be present. How much is this Treasury Department getting a tailwind from China? Also from ECB expectations, Deutsche, uh, Deutsche, Deutsche Bank coming out and saying they actually expect the ECB to go faster with a 50 basis point rate cut as soon as December. So, you know, on the margins, it's all systems to go for rate cuts. The things are coming together. They're coming together. Under surveillance this morning, a top story for you, China, unleashing a wave of stimulus measures in a bid to boost the economy. Mm -hmm. President Xi and the country's Politburo pledging to backstop the real estate market and limit the construction of new homes. The government also offering cash handouts to people in extreme poverty. So I think the question we've all been asking is why now? For months, people have been questioning when are they going to come out? The last time they made a decision out of the normal time frame they normally would, this group was, um, of course, when they were still reeling from the COVID-19 pandemic. I come back to that Deutsche uh, Goldman Sachs note over the summer. The reason why they've been cautious, Goldman Sachs has said over the summer, about doing all this fiscal stimulus, the demand side stimulus, they want to save the ammunition in case they need to do a lot more in 2025. But Potentially, they see the weakening in their domestic market and they're looking over the United States and they're like, well, whether it's Trump or Harris, there's still going to be a lot of protectionist talk 
coming out of Washington. Before we even understand the motivations and exactly the timing, it is interesting to notice how big the shift has been in the rhetoric from economists and analysts analyzing this. Here's one. This stimulus package endorsed by today's Politburo meeting represents a strategic shift in macro policy, talking about how this could actually stimulate confidence in domestic spending. Maybe it matters exactly why now, but it also matters potentially even more whether it works. And that is what I think a lot of people are looking at. This is what we heard from Goldman this week. At the moment, it's good for markets. Let's see if it works and it actually gains traction in the real economy. Right now, it's really good for markets. Let's turn to this story, the drama in European banking, a soap opera, Commerce Bank vowing to boost profitability and increase shareholder returns as it ramps up talks with Unicredit. The German lender seeking to shore up investor support as it gears up for a potential takeover. Its first meeting with Unicredit set for Friday. I love this story, especially because I can't quite put my finger on how the German authorities are justifying their hatred of this deal. All I know is they have acknowledged that they cannot avoid having Unicredit of taking an even greater share uh, in Commerce Bank. The actual shareholders of Commerce Bank welcoming the input from Unicredit, which I find fascinating. They're saying, why not have an open dialogue? Thank you. Thank you. There was a quote from the German finance minister in the last week that I think warranted far more pushback and much more interrogation. And it read as following. The style of the Unicredit approach has unsettled many shareholders. <laughs> OK. Yeah. In what universe does a chart going up and to the right aggressively unsettle anyone who holds the stock? In what universe? We're up by close to 30 percent in two weeks. And we're supposed to believe the German finance minister when he says it's unsettled shareholders. Unsettled which shareholders? The German government. Unsettled who else? I'm struggling to find them. Who would be unhappy with this result? Why don't we ask one? Alexandra Anecki, a portfolio manager at Union Investment. What do you think? Oh, here's her quote. Uh, we think Commerce Bank should be willing to have an open dialogue. Cooperation with Unicredit in whichever, for Unicredit in whichever form doesn't need to be Commerce Bank's detriment. Two things about the finance ministry. One, everyone's talking about stealth mode of Unicredit. Where was the finance min ministry? They basically walked into this. How did they not know Unicredit was building the stake in Commerce Bank that they so love? The German government is ruled right now by three parties. The finance ministry is the FDP. Do you know what they stand for? Free market, pro-business. So I'm a little bit confused as per the statement you read out that they're saying uh, shareholders don't want this deal. It appears they're open to European integration so long as they're the ones driving European integration and combinations. That's the only way of putting this. It really is. I mean, I could talk about this all day, but the hypocrisy of the German policymaker is something to behold. It never ceases to amaze me. Is it effective? And I think that, you know, yes, I would agree with you. I think that if you take it a step further, they can't stop Unicredit for coming in, whether it's through a backdoor channel or otherwise. Is this a new model for how to gain some uh, sort of pseudo consolidation in European banks. Micron shareholders unsettled this morning. The stock is up by 15 <laughs> percent. Let's talk about OpenAI. Reportedly in discussions to restructure the company as a for profit business. People familiar with the matter telling us at Bloomberg the company is weighing a 7 percent equity stake for CEO Sam Altman. It would mark the first time he'd be granted ownership in the startup and a shift from its original plan as a nonprofit. My favorite thing is, OK, they might not be a nonprofit. And yes, he might get a 10 billion dollar uh, windfall payout. But it might become a public benefit corporation. Did you see this? A public benefit corporation, which is a company considering uh, basically uh, being for the good of people. So what isn't a public benefit corporation? Big Tobacco, I'm sure that they're going to say that they are because they're basically helping people quit with vapes. I mean, to me, there are so many different aspects to this. But how do you virtue signal at a time when you are ultimately creating the code that's going to set the groundwork for a lot of social interactions going forward? And not say you're a public benefit corporation, because if you're not, we have bigger problems. We're benefiting people, but also we're capitalists. We want to make money. The question I have is that this is coming out of time when there's a huge exodus of a lot of senior management at the company. I wonder how that potentially is going to affect some plans. Big story in this part of the world this morning. Let's get to a bigger one in the Middle East. Western allies joining Arab leaders in a bid for a three-week ceasefire between Israel and Hezbollah. The talks are looking to avoid an all-out war in the Middle East after days of Israeli airstrikes across the border in Lebanon. Bloomberg's Jumana Basechi joins us now for more. Jumana, can you walk us through just how close we are to a deal? 
Well, diplomatic strides have certainly been, been made in the last 24 hours. It was significant that President Biden and President Macron, alongside other EU leaders and Arab leaders as well, put out that statement calling for an uh, immediate ceasefire on the Lebanon-Israel border and also saying that it's necessary for residents uh, from both sides to be able to return safely back to their uh, homes close to the border. So that was the statement that was put out. Now, the key question from here is, are Israel and Hezbollah going to sign up to this ceasefire proposal? Uh, and so far, there has not been an official response. We have not heard an official response from the Israeli prime minister. And in Lebanon, now, the government seems to be open to the proposal. I had the opportunity to speak to the Lebanon economy minister earlier today. I asked him about the ceasefire proposal, and he said it's very welcome, it's necessary. And then I pressed him and I said, but that is the Lebanese government's stance. Can you get... Hezbollah to sign up to the, the terms of the ceasefire as well. And he said, these are his, his words, that Hezbollah in the last 24 hours has shown flexibility with regards to moving towards a truce. Now, from Hezbollah's perspective, you have to think that in the past week, uh, they have suffered a, a lot of blows. Uh, the 3,000 uh, operatives uh, were critically injured in those explosions last week. They've lost senior commanders in the airstrikes that began at the beginning of this week. And so from their perspective, uh, would this be them uh, showing that they are conceding? Is this a sign of weakness from their perspective if they actually agree to the terms of the ceasefire proposal? But at the same time, there's a lot of pressure internally about the rising humanitarian toll, the rising number of civilian uh, casualties, uh, and there's pressure, deep pressure on the economy, which already was in a dire straits even before this war started. And then you add to that the other dimension of uh, Iran and Syria and the lack, the notable lack of language of them being inclined in any way of getting explicitly involved in this war. And so there is certainly a lot of pressure building on Hezbollah at this point. Uh, but the language that I got from the economy minister, minister suggested that they would be willing and Hezbollah are beginning to show some flexibility towards accepting a ceasefire. The thing I'm struggling with, Jumana, is that Biden officials are basically saying to reporters, potentially we're going to get Lebanon and Israel coming out in the next few hours agreeing to this deal. At the same time, Israel is preparing troops for a potential ground invasion. So if there was to be a deal, how long would this actually last and then what comes next? Yeah, I think that's a good question also to be putting to Ethan. I know you're speaking to him shortly, uh, our Jerusalem correspondent. Uh, but I, I would just say that airstrikes are continuing this morning. So, yes, the ceasefire proposal came out overnight. But uh, the airstrikes are continuing today, which tells you that the ceasefire has not actually started yet. And there have been, there's been a lot of talk about Israel preparing for the possibility of a ground offensive. But they have been very clear and that the war objective from this new front is to return security to the northern border. And it's difficult to envisage in Israel signing up to a ceasefire proposal that doesn't secure the border and that they are not they they will they won't come away from it feeling like there's a possibility that Hezbollah may start relaunching rockets once again. Let's get to Ethan right now. Jamana, appreciate the time as always. Jamana Basachi happened to leave some of our coverage out of the region. Ethan Brunner joins us right now from Tel Aviv. Ethan, let's talk about the objectives on the northern border. What does security look like? What does that look like to the Israelis? To the Israelis, security looks like uh, being able to live there and not be afraid that of either missiles, rockets, or um, fighters coming across in the way that uh, it happened in the south from Hamas in Gaza. So that's fundamentally on October 8th when Hezbollah joined in solidarity with what was happening in the south. The uh, 65, 85,000 people had to leave their homes and they haven't gone back. So they feel that they can't live there, that the country has become reduced in size, and until they feel secure, they won't go back. Ethan, how much appetite is there among the Israeli population to have another ground invasion at the same time that they're still uh, deeply entrenched in Gaza? Well, I, I, I haven't seen a poll on that point, so I can't really answer, but my instinct is that uh, there has been a growing impatience in Israel to actually uh, take a more aggressive stand toward Hezbollah. The feeling in this country is that Hezbollah's 
uh, attacks on Israel over the last year are completely unmerited. There's no, uh, gr there's no land dispute between them, and that Hezbollah is just doing this out of ideology, and that Israel mustn't put up with it anymore, that Israel has been watching uh, the developments of Hezbollah over the last 18 years since their last war, and that people would, in fact, rather embrace a strong military response. Now, you're right that ground invasion involves an enormous amount of risk, uh, but uh, this is a fairly bellicose nation at this point. Ethan, appreciate the update out of the region. A tough time for you and the team. I know Ethan Bronner there of Bloomberg out of Tel Aviv. Things changed, I think, this week. The issues on the northern border came into central Israel. We talked about this just yesterday. The Israeli military saying it intercepted a missile that was heading for central Israel and intercepting that projectile for the first time. I mean, that's a real, that's a real issue for that the, country. That's another red line almost a year into what has been going on in Israel, that you have this red line just evaporated. And we're going to hear from Benjamin Netanyahu. He is set to be in New York today as part of the UN General Assembly. And potentially we're going to get some updates on this ceasefire deal between Lebanon and Israel. But what happens after three weeks? Keep that on your radar later on this afternoon. Let's give an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg Brief. Here's Yahira Hackers. Hey, Yahira. Hi, John. Congress has successfully passed the stopgap bill to avoid a government shutdown ahead of the election. The temporary measure will fund most government agencies at current levels for the time being, but another resolution will have to be made to avoid a shutdown in December. The bill now heads to President Joe Biden to be signed into law. Meanwhile, Micron shares are surging up more than 15% in the pre-market. The largest U.S. maker of computer memory chips gave a sales and profit outlook that came in well ahead of Wall Street estimates. The upbeat forecast is the latest sign Micron is benefiting from a boom in AI spending. Orders for a type of product called high bandwidth memory have added a lucrative new revenue stream for the company and other chip makers. And a look at another stock, shares of food service provider Aramark are rising more than 5% in the pre-market. Sources telling us here at Bloomberg that French food catering firm Sodexo is exploring a potential acquisition of its U.S. rival. Sources say Sodexo, which has catered several Olympics games, is hoping to expand overseas. But of course, a potential deal could still face antitrust scrutiny. Sodexo would also need to secure the funds for such a sizable acquisition. Sodexo is currently valued at about $12 billion, while Aramark is valued at $10 billion. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Yahara, thank you. More from Yahara in about 30 minutes' time. Up next on the program, the promise of fiscal support in China. I think this is a step in the right direction. Uh, we've wondered why they've been dragging their feet. Uh, I think they just don't want to follow the path that many Western economies followed in a global financial crisis. Big shift in China this week, as Lisa said earlier this morning. Up next on the program, City's Rob Sokin from New York. You're watching Bloomberg TV. Equities with a lift. We're up eight tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. A rally in base metals, a pickup this week off the back of the effort in China. If you're looking at commodities, that's the move there. If you're looking at commodity currencies, the Aussie outperforming. Some single names: Baidu, Baba, JD.com. Lisa, absolutely ripping in the pre-market. More leverage to the consumer. Does the consumer actually have more capacity to spend now that there are these uh, payments being made to companies, uh, to, to individuals that are impoverished? Just to understand the psychology of what the shift really came from is going to be important for people having faith that it truly can continue. Let's get to it. Under surveillance this morning, the promise of fiscal support in China. I think this is a step in the right direction. Uh, we've wondered why they've been dragging their feet. Uh, I think they just don't want to follow the path that many Western economies followed in a global financial crisis. Monetary policy will be somewhat ineffective. Um, fiscal will need more, and some of the banking capital infusions, I think, are, uh, again, a step in the right direction. So uh, whether they want to admit it or not, Chinese officials have to adopt some of the Western playbook from right. 2010, 2011. So here's the latest. China pledging to support the economy with fiscal spending in an effort to revive growth. Rob Sokin of City writing for China. Many indicators continue to highlight cyclical softness, including the global manufacturing PMI and new lending to households and corporates. We recently lowered growth for this year to 4.7% and next year to 4.2%, risk still looks skewed to the downside. Rob joins us for more. Rob, good morning. Morning. Does this change the story for you? 
It could, it could. You know, those downgrades uh, were before this, uh, these stimulus announcements, and we were seeing a lot of cyclical weakness over the last few months. Uh, and so this is good news. It's, it's, it's a lot more than, than I would have expected. We were kind of expecting sort of a drip, drip, minor policy initiatives throughout the year. Uh, but that being said, uh, there's still some deep concerns about the economy. Really, you have a consumer there that is very hesitant to spend. Uh, confidence is still at subterranean levels. Uh, and the question is, will this be enough um, to really lift uh, animal spirits and really get the consumer out and spending again? I'm hopeful. Uh, so it could change the story, but we have to see how the boots hit the ground. Let's talk about the problem. We've heard it described as a classic balance sheet recession, a deflationary trap like the likes of we saw in Japan, hints of that in Europe in the last decade or so at times as well. Are those examples, do they serve as decent examples for what China is experiencing currently or is this different? I think that's a big part of the story is that you've had this property sector unwind for, for several years now. That is a big part of household wealth in China. And so that acts as a negative wealth effect, a restraining factor on consumer spending. But there's also a lot of deep uh, issues here aside from that. You know, you've had very youth, high youth unemployment there. Um, and again, that doesn't exactly engender confidence in people to go out and spend. So I think the balance sheet elements, the housing sector is a big part of that. But I think there's also big questions about how in an economy of deeply aging demographic, demographics that you're not placing the youth into jobs um, at a higher rate. And so I think there are other structural issues here. There's a question about how much Chinese authorities have truly changed their approach. There's also a question of how much stimulus helps the rest of the world's economy, let alone uh, just Chinese uh, economics. Do you see a, a pretty big read through to the U.S., probably not as much as Europe? And or is this, do you think, really more focused on domestic consumptions, domestic activity in a way that is much more inside looking? I think uh, you, you will get some spillover effects, especially as uh, if we end up uh, being too bearish on the outlook and growth is a, is a bit higher than, than our expectations. The read through to the U.S. I think would be fairly minor, uh, probably a bit more to Europe. But I think this is much more about uh, a domestic story and boosting domestic demand. You know, exports has kind of saved the day for China's economy um, over the last uh, several quarters. That's really been where the strength has. And I think the authorities going to be more focused about how do we boost domestic consumption, how we boost domestic demand. Is it only because what's going on domestically in China or are they seeing the headlines coming out of the United States? Well, you know, that's one reason I uh, thought that they would maybe be more hesitant to pull out kind of a policy bazooka at this stage. Uh, you know, we have a lot of conversations about this. Why were they doing such drip, drip stimulus? And, you know, often we would hear, well, they were saving some of that bazooka out of fears of what would come out the other side of the November election, especially if you would end up with a second Trump administration where he's mentioned potentially putting much higher and larger amounts of tariffs. So um, so this is a bit surprising, the announcement. Maybe I think what's probably happened is they were looking at just how soft the data were coming in. A lot of analysts, including us, were warning they were at risk of missing their growth target. So they decided to go big, go sooner. What if it is Trump? What do they have left to do? Well, you know, then there's a lot of unpredictability. You know, I do think in terms of China, um, the Harris administration posture would be very tough and the Trump administration posture would be very tough. You know, the Biden administration hasn't removed any of the tariffs on China and in fact added more. So I think China's in a tough spot no matter what, but I think they're really worried about uh, is, well, if you do get a Trump 2.0, um, would you get something like a 60 percent tariff or just much higher tariffs on goods? I don't think that's where we would end up, but I think that's what they're worried about. Um, and then they'd have to uh, find ways to respond. All things being equal, given how much the Fed has just cut rates and is expected to cut rates, how much room have they paved for the rest of the world to cut rates pretty aggressively? Yeah, I think this is a big story. You know, you had uh, the Fed earlier this year look like they were going to cut five or six times. Uh, that end up being delayed. And a lot of other, I think, rate cuts have been slower than expected and, de and delayed as well. You've seen that in emerging markets um, and you've seen that around the world. And now that I think the Fed's opened the floodgates, I think it opens up the door for other central banks to move faster as well. Now, right now, it depends you know, what they do after this. But let's say the Fed were to move with another 50 basis point move. Um, I think it's easier among these other central banks to create consensus for moving faster. Um, and uh, they have to worry less about what happens with their exchange rate. So I think we're in a, the midst of a global easing cycle, but a fast moving Fed can open the door for that to be faster as well. Rob, it's good to see you. Smart stuff great. as always. Rob Sock in a city. City's mentioned this before. Lisa's mentioned this before. 
Can you imagine how much worse things would be if China hadn't waited and started doing this stuff in 2021, 2022? How much worse global inflation would be? That's the question. Oh, goodness. How much was this sort of the global de disinflation and deflation that we've been seeing over the past couple of months? Could have been a whole lot worse. Up next, Evan Brown of UBS, Doug Redica of International Capital Strategies will speak to Barbara Humpton of Siemens and Jerome Schneider of PIMCO, the second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, just around the corner. I wouldn't consider valuations to be a detractor for markets heading higher. I can still get the equity market up to 7,000. That's my highest target. You could see markets uh, continue to see momentum here. I actually see mid caps as potentially a better way, a better beneficiary and kind of a hedge in your term. To me, the market is pricing that the average outcome of all possible scenarios. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. On course to open up at all-time highs on the S&P 500. Equity futures look like this. Check out your scores up by eight-tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, up by more than that. Tech is absolutely ripping. We'll talk about Micron later this hour. Up in the pre-market by almost 15 percent. We'll need to talk about China. Check out these single names. The likes of Baba, Baidu, JD.com. Moves of more than five percent across the board as China starts to look more and more open to some fiscal stimulus. We've already seen the rate cuts. Now comes uh, direct payments to poorer households ahead of a national holiday. We'll talk more in detail about exactly what the proposal was. There is a broader point here, and Rob Sockin just highlighted just how much this Federal Reserve with a 50 basis point rate cut and more down the pike has opened the door to a faster easing cycle around the world, and that includes China, even though it does seem like a kind of pivot from previous uh, views. Rob Sockin was really interesting, really talking about the issues that are happening happening right now in China. Confidence, he called it subterranean levels. That is where the domestic market is right in. He, he was saying he was one of those believers that potentially China was going to hold back and wait. It, you have to think, how much more firepower are they going to have, depending on what kind of policy we're going to get in Washington in 2025? We've been through some of the moves. Dollar c &H, the offshore yuan, a break of seven. First time in 16 months we saw that in yesterday's session. It holds this morning. Elsewhere in the FX market, commodity currencies, the Aussie, outperforming. You've seen the move in stocks. Let's talk about commodities. Base metals perking up. What isn't happening? Check out crude. Brent, WTI, down by more than 2%. This is a different story. This is a different story because the Financial Times is talking about the fact that the Saudis are no longer chasing price. You know, unofficially, they want $100 a barrel on uh, Brent, and they want to go after market share now. Potentially, they're concerned that you see the U.S. record oil production. They want to make sure they do not lose out on that market share. So now they're just going to let it rip. I love this. You thought that macro was confusing before. Get this. How does this follow some sort of global recovery and rate cutting cycle? Oil is no longer a macroeconomic indicator. It is something else that is being swayed by political uh, considerations. And if you do get some kind of price war, how do you factor that into inflation reads at a time where that used to be some sort of leading indicator on consumer behavior? Brent crude right now, 71, 72. A little bit later this morning, 8.30 Eastern time, jobless claims and a ton of Fed speak. Pick your Fed speaker. Who do you like? They're probably talking. Who do you want to hear from? Oh, you pointed out John Williams earlier this morning that that was one to watch for sure because he's one of the big three. I'm interested in hearing Mickey Bowman again because I always like hearing dissent. But frankly, all of them, Collins, Kugler, Barr, Cook, Kashkari, I want to compare their speech now to what it was, say, last week or the week before, uh, before the quiet periods that we get a sense of how much they shifted in tandem with Jay Powell. And why was it? That meeting alone that changed things. What was it in the quiet period? Was it Chairman Powell getting everyone together and saying, got to do this? Was it something about CPI? Governor Wallace suggested it was. I'm not so sure. It was revisions. That's what we found out. Now, I think, honestly, I think it's also this idea that if you get inflation data that comes in below expectations or even in line, how much is that alone without weakness really give them the confidence to go more aggressively? Next stop for this market, jobless claims, 8.30 Eastern time. Coming up this hour, we'll catch up with Evan Brown of UBS on why we should price out a recession, not price in a recession. Doug Redeker of International Capital Strategies as Kamala Harris makes her economic pitch. And Barbara Humpton of Siemens on the growing demand to power AI. We begin this hour with the promise
promise of fiscal stimulus out of China. Equities rallying worldwide ahead of jobless claims in the U.S. and comments from Chairman Powell. Evan Brown of UBS saying recession risk needs to be further priced out. Investors poured money into defensive trades over the last couple of months, but resilient U.S. economic data and a proactive Fed have meaningfully reduced the left tail. We look for Treasury yields to continue bouncing from here and cyclical sectors to outperform defensives. Evan's with us for more. Evan, good morning. Good morning. Before we get to the market calls, let's start with the call on the economy. How encouraged are you by what you saw from the Fed last week and what you've seen from China this week? Very encouraged. I mean, it, look, when you, when you have a meaningful change in messaging from two of the uh, most important economic actors in the world, which would be Jay Powell and, and uh, I guess President Xi and the broader Politburo, it, it pays to, to listen. And what we saw from, from Powell uh, it was a message of lab labor markets, fine, we're going to keep it there. We are going to keep it there. And so I think the bar is very low for them to keep doing 50s. You know, ultimately, inflation has come down quite a bit, and, uh, and that enables them to act more aggressively. This is something Deutsche Bank said as well. Are you suggesting the next 100 basis points, 150 basis points of easing is actually an easy decision? I, I don't know if it's an easy decision. I just think that... They, the next, well, yeah, look, look, I think the next 100, 125, we're going we're gonna to get. The more aggressive that they are right now, uh, the less I think they have to do later. Ultimately, you're, 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 as you're saying, we're bringing down recession risk because they're acting sooner and more aggressively at this point. At a certain point, you have to wonder, how much does this leave inflation as a bigger concern, even if recession is less of a concern? We were talking about that with longer term yields picking up just a touch. You have to imagine, are we truly seeing just a return to the past normal? Or is this going to be a new inflationary environment where officials aren't willing to allow the economy to collapse enough to create that disinflation? Yeah, I think we're we're a long way from inflation becoming a a meaningful concern again. I think uh, you know we were just talking about oil and and what's happening there. And oil is uh, you know, that's a major disinflationary force, not just on a headline level, but ripples through into into core inflation. Um, the labor market is still cooling. You would need to see like a, a, a re-tightening of the labor market, I think, to get like domestically generated inflation getting going again. Um, so I, I kind of think this is the best of all worlds where they're supporting growth. Maybe inflation becomes more of an issue if we get Trump tariffs and, and the like down the road. Um, but, but I think that's you know, kind of tomorrow's story as opposed to today. The story that you're painting makes me think the U.S. is less exceptional. And frankly, everything else looks a little more exceptional, especially on the valuations that they're currently trading at. Is that how you're looking at it? I think the U.S. is still exceptional in, in one clear way, which is that we have a great productivity story here. We have seen productivity pick up in the U.S. Uh, yes, employment has been coming down, but GDP growth has been really, really strong. And that's allowed us also to get unit labor cost inflation lower. You're not seeing that in Europe. You're, you're still seeing ongoing supply chain issues, corporate margin issues and, and the like. You're not seeing that in the UK. Um, and so the US is still quite exceptional on that front. When we talk about the equity markets, though, of course, a lot of that good news, more of it is priced in the U.S. and the rest of the world, as is almost always the case. You also like China, especially versus Europe. But how much is the European story dependent on what happens next in China and if what's happening with fiscal and monetary stimulus actually works? Yeah, I think, it, look, I, it, what happens in China, there's going to be some positive leak through into, into Europe, especially with some of the big luxury names. If you can shore up consumer confidence in China, then um, that, that helps on that front. I still think Europe faces a number of, uh, of, of domestic challenges. You know, you still have stubborn wages. You still have uh, German manufacturing sector that, that is in pretty, pretty bad shape. And you, we had from Mario Draghi last, uh, last week or maybe the week before him talking about how do we get Europe more competitive. And it's almost a sad read because you see such great work such interesting work of things that can and should be done, but so little confidence that uh, the institutional framework is going to allow politically these reforms to, to happen. Well, let me so, jump in. Mm -hmm. As an investor looking at Europe, how do you react when the German finance ministry sounds almost unsettled by stock going up? Yeah, I mean, that's... What, that's, what does that tell you about the situation in Europe? Because that's ultimately what's happened in the last two weeks. Look, I think that's... that's 
you know, the underlying, yeah, there, there's an underlying institutional issues that are going to hold Europe back. Now, I don't think I'm, I'm saying anything that's not uh, already reflected in, in European equities. They're very cheap and they can receive some bounce from this, this China improvement and maybe the ECB gets a little more aggressive and so that, that, that helps. Um, but structurally, it's, it's hard to make this long-term investment case for Europe relative to, to the U.S. LVMH right now, you mentioned luxury. LVMH over in Europe up by more than 6% at the moment. So we're seeing that running in luxury, as you might expect. On the menu, a number of asset classes. Let's pick three. So equities, commodities, foreign exchange. Out of those three, to price out recession, what does that mean? To price in what now and where? Yeah, so I think uh, what we'll, we'll see more, most it most clear is what's happening in the in inter, excuse me in equities uh, regionally and intra sector and and uh, you know like I said a lot of people poured money into defensive sectors here in the U S I think we've got to price a lot of that out I think recession risk that left tail has been well, let's pick a sector utilities what does it leave you given that that run up is actually just off the back of AI as well as the defensive nature of the particular group of stocks as well. What do you do with utilities? Utilities is, is, the, is the trickiest one because of that AI. I mean, uh, in itself, utilities look extremely overbought. We've seen tons of ETF flows into utilities. It's all telling us, especially given the macro dynamics and our view that yields can bounce from here, um, that utilities should be vulnerable. Uh, but then you get these, these big AI power demand announcements and, and that's, uh, uh, that's, so I think among the defensives, utilities look a little bit better. I think in, you know, staples, real estate and, and uh, uh, healthcare probably underperform utilities. At least you have that AI story, story there in utilities. Just listening to you, it seems like overweight small caps, equal weight, overweight Chinese equities, maybe peripherally uh, European securities, underweight bonds, and have a high holiday. Is that basically your view? Yeah, I think so. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of like, it, it, it's, it's, would, it, it, it's like a, a reflation with, without, the refl, without the inflation. It's kind of how I'm, I'm thinking about it. And that, uh, like the, this pricing out of recession risk, but now you have oil coming down for supply reasons, and hopefully that you know the Middle East doesn't doesn't escalate much further from here. Um, but if oil's coming down for supply reasons, you know that's another very stimulative thing for for uh, the private sector and, and consumers. So I think we have this this kind of uh, you know stimulus from China, stimulus from the Fed, stimulus just more globally, and we're setting up for just this better economic picture than people thought going into year end and, and next year. Always enjoy your work. Just fantastic to catch up. It's been too long as well. Come back soon. Evan Brown of UBS and an audition for a spare seat at UBS if there is one from Bramo there on Wet's <laughs> Your Money. <laughs> well, I was just trying to envision, OK, what would this kind of look like? I love the idea of stimulus from China, stimulus from the Fed, stimulus from the ECB and stimulus from Saudi Arabia, because that's what you have this morning. So true. <laughs> I mean, so, essentially, so how much is that going to be a tailwind if you have oil prices falling for the right reasons, which is not the right reasons, but for reasons that are not having to do with a lack of demand for better the reasons. economy is falling off a cliff? It's difficult to be bearish this morning. Stocks are up by eight tenths of one percent on the S&P with an update on stories elsewhere with your Bloomberg brief. Here's Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. We start with Disney announcing new job cuts. The company is laying off workers at the corporate level as part of a continuing effort to improve the profitability of the business. The website deadline reported that about 300 jobs in legal, human resources, finance, and communications were impacted. Divisions including ESPN and theme parks weren't involved in this round of cuts. Meanwhile, oil prices are falling for a second day with Saudi Arabia reported to be lining up an increase in output later this year. Brent prices are down about 5% from Tuesday's close. And as you can see, WTI is now below the $70 mark. The Financial Times reported that Saudi Arabia is ready to abandon its unofficial oil price target of $100 a barrel in a bid to regain market share. Separately, factions in Libya have reached a deal that could open the way to the return of some crude production in the country. And Hurricane Helene is strengthening as it approaches the Florida Gulf Coast. It's expected to become a Category 4 storm before it makes landfall in the U.S. this evening. Several counties along the coast are already under evacuation orders as the National Hurricane Center warns the storm currently poses a, quote, life-threatening situation. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, appreciate the update there. Thank you. Up next on the program, economic policy taking center stage.
I'm imposing tariffs on your competition from foreign countries, all these foreign com- countries that have ripped us off. I know the power of American innovation, and I believe companies need to play by the rules. That conversation up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Equity futures on the S&P, a real lift, up by eight-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. A rally in Europe, a pickup in China-related names. The rip-roar in China story, Lisa, continues. Yeah, and for good reason. I mean, basically, you have a Politburo that is now opening the door to fiscal stimulus, which is a door that they hadn't opened before. A series of rate cuts getting warmer. Is this going to be the bazooka? And that's basically what people are discussing today. Not spinning over to the U.S. bond market. Yields are a little bit lower. We're down a basis point or two. The 10-year, let's call it 377. Under surveillance this morning, economic policy taking center stage. I'm imposing tariffs on your competition from foreign countries, all these foreign com- countries that have ripped us off. Your companies are gonna come in, they're gonna pay a low tax rate and a really low tax rate if they make their product in America. I believe in consistent and transparent rules of the road to create a stable business environment. And I believe companies need to play by the rules. It's the latest. Donald Trump and Kamala Harris detailing their plans for the economy at campaign events in the swing states of Pennsylvania and North Carolina. Douglas Redeker of International Capital Strategies writing, neither party is fully explaining how to pay for their plans. There are no responsible fiscal hawks this year. Both plans increase the national debt over the next several decades, but Trump much more, almost twice as much. Doug joins us now for more. Doug, good morning. Morning. Music to Lisa's ears. Let's talk about it. (laughs) Do we need responsible deficit hawks? We do, but it's an election year. So in the context of an election, the idea is to win. And I think both candidates understand that. So we'll get to the fiscal responsibility part later. Right now, they're both making promises that I think anyone who has any kind of bond market focus and long-term you know, debt deficit um, concern is probably not sleeping well at night. But this is an election year. Doug, how different are their policy proposals? Because a lot of things they talk about are one and the same when it comes to the child tax credit, when it comes to things like no tax on tip, when it comes to things about ratcheting back some red tape, less regulation so American companies can start producing more in the United States. There's a lot of overlap between these two campaigns. Well, I'd I'd take it a step back. I'd say the old days where industrial policy was a bad set of words and free trade was a you know, the, the, the norm, those are gone. So now we're at different gradations of how the government plays a central role in the economy. And you're right that in that context, both of them have drifted towards industrial policy and a central role for the government. But I think it diverges from there. I think Trump's view is, you know, very much backward looking. He wants America the way it was in the 1950s and 60s. America was the dominant superpower. We had an industrial base, a manufacturing economy. But we are living in the 21st century. So even though she is embracing some of these policies that are more government-centric, that are more spend, let's not worry about how we're going to pay for it until later, I don't think that the specifics overlap all that much. Her embrace of tariffs, for example, which was very muted in her policy plan yesterday, is a very different animal than Trump's. Trump believes that tariffs are the silver bullet. They will solve everything, geopolitically, economically, financially. I mean, that's just, you know, give me a problem that a tariff will solve it. She's more targeted. She's more measured. She's more forward-looking. Uh, I'm not saying that I agree with every word in her 82 pages yesterday, but it certainly was more well thought out than his more across the board, throw it against the wall and see what sticks. You're here for meetings alongside the UN General Assembly, but you talk to everyone in Washington. Is there a party that if you're a free trade capitalist, you can belong to anymore? Uh, no. I mean, the sad answer is the, the, the Jack Kemp, Paul Ryan, uh, even Mitt Romney Republican Party doesn't exist. Now, I think there's a hope amongst many centrists and many Republicans that if Trump loses, and if he loses in such a way that he somehow goes away, that the Republican Party is not going to revert back to the old days, the country club Republicans who believed in free trade. 
um, but that there would be a resurgence of that business-friendly, market-friendly mindset where trade is not a bad word. I'm not sure that's going to happen anytime soon, but I think that's the broad hope. Lisa brought this up earlier, and it's a really good point when it comes to U.S. Steel and Nippon Steel. Something Kamala Harris said yesterday was basically she's more in the Jake Sullivan camp than the Janet Yellen camp, which is national security matters more maybe than jobs. What is the direction of travel for either of these two candidates when it comes to, say, you're a foreign company and you're from an ally country and you want to do business in the United States? Yeah, so I think both parties, both candidates, understandably have put a premium on national security over pure commercial interests. I think that's probably the mindset we have to get used to. The Nippon Steel deal is a little more problematic because the national security justification is at best a stretch, but I do think the Japanese and most corporates around the world in Japan and elsewhere understand this is in the context of Pennsylvania being it, a, if not the most important state in the election, and the, the general atmospherics around this election. So I'm not looking at that as Kamala Harris has now decided that even allies like Japan are not worthy of making foreign investments into this country because they are at national security risk. I think it's more of a unique circumstance. Let's build on this, this idea of understanding what the framework is currently to measure national security versus sort of capitalistic business interests and jobs. Do we have a sense of some sort of predictable framework to determine that exact evaluation? You actually want me to define small garden high fence. Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> th th yes, th that's, please. so we don't know how small the garden is. We don't know how high the fence is. We don't know what's in, what's out. Um, it's an expanding, flexible concept. And national security isn't something you can quantify. So I think that there are some judgment calls that are baked into it. But you're right in questioning just how far down the road this government or the next government can go um, and what certainty investors are going to have in that context. Well, just to take this a step further, if I'm a company and I want to do a takeover, or I want to do a dealer, I want to know where to source my materials, how do I know when that's going to enter the crosshairs of national security? When it could be materials, it could be chips, it could be our food chain, it could be anything. And, you know, we saw that with respect to some of the supply chain questions having to do with the, the, with the conflict in the Middle East. How do we understand when that crosses that red line? So, first of all, the CFIUS process is supposed to be confidential and is supposed to address that. So if you are a company looking to make an acquisition under that context, then you're supposed to have this confidential process where that gets fleshed out and it doesn't meet the front pages or the airwaves. The Nippon Steel deal set a precedent, unfortunately, to make a lot of this public. And that's actually a bad thing because it means a politicized CFIUS process is now potentially a public politicized CFIUS process, which means you can play out some of the arguments you're describing in the leaking on the media stuff that it has previously been a, <laughs> Why a, a shouldn't it be public? Sad. Because national security issues are often ones that are subject to confidential sources, confidential information. There's a lot of reasons why these things do not want to be on the front pages. And so I'm a little bit upset over the CFIUS process being playing out, playing out the way it has even well, as much as the underlying question of how you define national security. What Lisa's getting at, though, I think is important, Doug. It's been difficult under this administration who have appeared to use national security as a pretense, a sophisticated way of basically just exploring the same protectionist, pr protectionist bent that the former president used. So it's really hard for me to understand what is really a national security issue? What really is just about a sophisticated excuse to do the same thing the former president was doing without saying we're like him, to sit here and say so we're different? To some degree, the problem is the Nippon Steel deal, because that is the one in which there's a lot of reasons to believe that they are stretching the national security definition. But I would also argue that dual use in the current context, whether it is what we've seen in Russia, Ukraine, or what we've seen in China, means that dual use, so those items that are commercial but can also be used for military purposes, is an expanding definition. So there's a legitimate case to be made that things that were not national security threats a decade ago are national security threats now. If you've got a dishwasher that has, that has a chip that finds its way into a, Ukraine, a Russian drone, then, you know, you would say, why are you calling a dishwasher a national security threat? And actually, it turns out it is. Doug, smart, as always. 
It's good to see you. Let's do it again soon. Douglas Rudiker of International Capital Strategies. Up next on the program, Barbara Humpton, the CEO of Siemens on the build out to power AI. Two hours away from the open and bell, your equity market at session highs on the S&P 500 advancing by eight tenths of 1%, on the Nasdaq 100 up by 1.5. Micron in the pre-market is absolutely ripping, up by more than 14%, approaching 15% higher in the pre-market earlier this morning on a better outlook from that name. But the additional lift this morning comes from China. Let's talk about these three names, Baidu, Alibaba, JD.com, moves of anywhere between five and 8%. And it's not just those names listed here in America. Check out the luxury listed names over in Europe. LVMH up by more than 7%. Hermes up by 7 as well. Anything that touches China right now is rallying. Suddenly, the bazooka is getting revved up. Maybe it'll fully uh, go on blast from the Polyp Euro as they do ramp up. Not only uh, just monetary stimulus, but now fiscal stimulus with payments directly to lower income households. Key question here, a couple of them. First of all, why now? But also, how much is this going to be domestic consumption and not necessarily uh, some sort of stimulative boost to the externally facing aspects of the Chinese economy? We started the week by saying, what's the opposite of a toxic brew? Lisa's Toxic Brew, and you said soft landing Nirvana. Yeah, yeah. China's helping out, aren't they? And there's so many aspects of the soft landing Nirvana. There's a global rate cutting cycle, there's stimulus coming from China, and now there's stimulus coming from Saudi Arabia in the form of a, some kind of race to the bottom for pricing, and it all comes together with a real bullish tilt this morning. Let's talk about that Saudi story just briefly. AMH Brent crude at 71.63, WTI around 68. We're down by more than 2% here in the commodity market. Well, it looks like the Saudis, according to the FT, are deciding to not go after price anymore. They unofficially love oil around $100 for Brent. They've been trying that, not working, especially when you see the United States producing more than 13 million barrels a day. So now what they're going to do, they're going to go after market share. And they're going to be the best at this. And that means prices are likely going to be coming down. Well, let's talk about the bond market then. Let's get to that story. Yields are lower. I just wonder if Treasuries are speaking to what Anne-Marie's talking about more than what we're talking about with regards to China. The fact that you end up with some sort of disinflation from a price war having to do with oil, a supply side driven decline in oil prices that just helps this you know, soft landing nirvana that we're talking about. At a certain point, you have to wonder, has the threshold just gotten lower and lower for the Fed to be more aggressive in their rate cuts? And how much do we hear that tone from all of the Fed officials who are lined up to speak today? That move in the commodity market would certainly help. We've also got an auction later, I'm told, $44 billion of seven-year notes of 1 p.m. Eastern time. Seven-year notes tend to be a little hairy, so this could be interesting, but we haven't had that many interesting auctions recently, so I don't want to get too hyped, but it could be. No midday nap yeah. this afternoon. <laughs> Never. Tune in. Under Savannah this morning, a top story here in New York City. Some breaking news for you. The New York City mayor, Eric Adams, has been indicted following a federal corruption probe. Sources telling us here at Bloomberg it's not yet clear what the charges are. The indictment is expected to be unsealed later on today. Adams vowing to fight the charges and stay in office. And 6 a.m. this morning with the New York Times is reporting that federal agents are actually searching Gracie Mansion. Here's a little bit of what the New York Times is saying. A group of roughly a dozen men and women in business attire arrived outside the entrance to Gracie Mansion SUVs, at least one of which had a uh, place card talking about the federal law enforcement that they're law enforcement. They carried briefcases, backpacks, duffel bag, and maybe even one appeared to be a camera bag. So this is going to unfold very quickly as we wait for that indictment to be unsealed. All the script writers out there who've been on strike and waiting to create some things, there have been some real stories recently that they can tap into. This is one of them. What I find interesting, this is about potentially pay to play, particularly from the Turkish government, uh, and questions around that. The potential support, or lack thereof, that this mayor has from other Democratic officials. We talked about that earlier. This from Scott Stringer, the Manhattan Borough President and mayoral candidate. His fight is not our fight, and I think that that's the tone that you've heard pretty much across the Democratic Party. You've made this point a couple of times. It's not what we've heard, it's what we've not heard. Very little support coming from this party. Which means that the path of least resistance, how much is it for him to step down, which is what a lot of people are calling for. And then what's next? And we get to discuss that for another uh, day. You excited for that? You know, I actually am, just because I'm personally biased. I actually care about this city. I grew up here. I, I Most want people to see, that live here do. You know, I want to see it uh, do well and, and be safe and be clean and have good schools. You're and, running? 
<laughs> I don't know. Just wait. Maybe let's see how the box auction does. Lisa's thinking about it. Let's turn to this story. Lebanon's economy minister telling Bloomberg that Hezbollah has shown flexibility regarding a proposal for a ceasefire with Israel. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office saying the news about a ceasefire is incorrect and that the IDF will continue fighting with full force. Well, the administration is saying that we should expect a statement from Israel, from Lebanon, that they would agree to this short-term ceasefire. Uh, Netanyahu doesn't seem to be on board with that. He is going to be speaking at the UN. He is in arriving in New York today, and his speech really has taken on utmost importance now. I question what the administration plans to do. Tony Blinken is here in New York trying to work out a ceasefire agreement between Gaza. That has taken them about a year. And guess what? They have nothing to show for yet. So now they want to do diplomacy when it comes to Lebanon. Meanwhile, Israel is preparing for boots on the ground. Want to watch uh, the UN a little bit later. Just to combine these two stories, we had a friend message just yesterday who said that he would run for mayor and the first policy would be to move the UN and that perhaps all New York City people would vote for that. He was speaking to the choir. I know you've mentioned it. I'm getting some notes saying that I should not run. So. Is that a platform to run on? Who's telling you not to run? <laughs> I think no, it is no. a platform to run on. <laughs> they just want to hear about the bond auctions, So I long guess. as you do the show. Yeah, then, you know, could you imagine? Do what you want. From Gracie Mansion. You've got a zero bond in the afternoon. Yeah. Whenever that opens. <laughs> don't worry, I will. Never I'll been done what time it. it opens, but, you know, apparently that's a thing now. They now yeah. have a rooftop, so... They don't have a rooftop. No, they now have a rooftop. Oh, they now have a rooftop. That's good to know. Okay. okay. You know, plenty to do. Yeah, but I don't know about the UN. Okay. I kind of like the stamps. You like the what? Stamps. You can buy your own stamps that are separate for the UN because oh. it's actually its own kind of domicile. So that Didn't you know can, that. Yeah, so it's basically another country. It's not actually part of New York. It's its own thing. Very cool. Yeah. Like the Vatican. Yeah, exactly. But so not you... quite. <laughs> Carry on. Thanks. Kamala Harris saying maintaining domestic control of U.S. steel is more important than potential job losses from the proposed takeover by Japan's Nippon Steel. This is Nippon says it's talking with the United Steel Workers in a bid to build support for its $14.1 billion deal. You picked up on this line. I think it's a really important one. The idea that potentially there could be this trade-off and jobs could be sacrificed, but national security trumps it. There is a bigger question here, which is, do we have a sense of what national security concerns are? What that trigger is uh, that would create a preeminence of that as being the consideration over jobs, over some economic concerns? I don't have a sense of that. And honestly, Doug Redeker was trying to give a sense, well, yeah, you're not going to get that and it should probably be secret. But could it be abused then for personal issues or for potential specific political uh, causes? Well, we do know that under this CFIUS agreement, as these agencies come together, there's not an agreement right now, which is why they have these 90 days. The clock restarted for Nippon to basically bring their case forward. The question I have is whether or not CFIUS comes out with a review and puts it on Biden's desk before November 5th, because Biden said that he would veto that. And is that enough to potentially shore up some of those votes in those counties she needs in Pennsylvania? Yeah. This is becoming a bigger and bigger case study of how not to do it. Becoming a political football on a campaign trail right up through November and beyond. Yeah, and how it got into the public eye too, I think is going to be an increasing question. Let's turn to this story. The growing demand to power AI, forcing big tech to look for alternatives. Bloomberg Intelligence estimates Microsoft will pay Constellation Energy at least $100 per megawatt hour once the Three Mile Island nuclear plant restarts. Siemens USA is also looking to build out energy infrastructure in the face of new demands. The CEO, Barbara Humpton, joins us now for more. Barbara, it's good to see you. Jonathan, great to be with you. Let's start with the big picture, the energy trilemma, security, sustainability, affordability. Can we square that circle, that triangle? Can we address that issue? Well, we have to. I mean, the bottom line is the economy can only grow as fast as the grid. We need power for everything we're attempting to do as a nation right now. And so we have to find more sources of power. At the same time, we've got to attend to the security. And of course, affordability is a big issue. That's why Siemens is working on bringing technology into the mix. Maybe we're going to take longer than we like to bring new sources of power onto the grid, but we can use software and, and, and technology tools in order to manage the electrons we produce more effectively. Talk to us about the technology solutions. We hear all these things about off-grid solutions, microgrids. What are the kind of things that you're working on, working oh, with? Oh, yeah. This is really exciting. I've been sharing with a lot of colleagues that the grid edge may be the most exciting place to be in the economy right now. Think about all the building with all their electrical products. Think about the ability to now put uh, solar on buildings. In we, We've got batteries in cars, so we have many, many more components capable of storing or producing energy 
now we network all those together with software, with the, the grid components that create microgrids, giving us the ability to maybe separate parts of the grid for security reasons. If we've got, say, power or excuse me, uh, weather disruptions like we're expecting right now all across the country. The, so Siemens has been working for a long time. Most recently, you would have seen coverage of our Bronzeville project with ComEd, where we provided uh, a, a microgrid to the, uh, the neighborhood of Bronzeville, which integrates storage, power production, and produced enough excess energy that the utility was able to offer the community an electric vehicle so that people could make it to their doctor's appointments. The demand is there. Companies are willing to pay for it. Evidence Microsoft just, uh, just a moment ago. Uh, it raises a question, how much do we have the capacity to produce it in short order, the goods necessary? Uh, pardon me, which goods are we talking about, Lisa? Just in general, uh, whether it is having to do with the chips, whether it has to do ah. with the electrical uh, grid wiring, uh, whatever it has to do, the infrastructure necessary to make what you're talking about. This is exactly why Siemens has been investing in the U.S. Over the last year, we invested $500 million. One of the huge things was to open up new manufacturing in Texas for the electrical switchgear that will go into data centers and actually help at the grid edge. You'll be seeing an exciting announcement a little later on today, and I'd encourage everybody to be on the lookout for it in North Carolina as we continue to expand operations. How much are, is the end user and the end buyer uh, government agencies or government regulated agencies versus big companies like Microsoft? Right now, the, in, the hyperscalers obviously are at this. Um, and as I move across the country, I would tell you that if it were not for restrictions on the grid, the appetite for building AI data, data centers is uh, unlimited. But we all know that we're going to be actually limited by the amount of power that can be produced. So those hyperscalers are moving all around the country looking for where can they get gigawatts of power. And the best places for gigawatts of power sound like they're in the south, North Carolina, Texas. Often, oh, well, this is where we're making the switch gear, but you're seeing data centers pop up everywhere. So can you find an asset that's underutilized that can produce power? Put a data center close to it and make that local use of power very efficient. And so we're seeing all forms of energy actually coming back on the grid. The demand is definitely there in the United States. The Biden administration has been backing this with the Inflation Reduction Act, but I still hear complaints about per permitting and red tape and how hard it is to build something even like a transmission line. Do you come across those same problems? This is the issue in our world. Uh, Siemens is in the backbone of the economy, and so we're working hard on making sure that we do address the, the growth of the grid, for instance the growth of manufacturing. Permitting is key to being able to get us to move quickly. In the meantime, what we're encouraging people to do is everything they can behind the meter. Anything we can do to save energy means we have more energy to deploy for new growth. So get behind the meter, start doing energy conservation measures, but then likewise start implementing the kind of solutions that allow us to use our energy wisely. Can we talk about the EV charging business? Independent unit, independent business, why go in that direction with it? Yeah, you know, EV charging is a really critical business for the world right now. And Siemens has the know-how to create chargers. You know that we had committed to build a million EV chargers. And we recently actually acquired Heliox to be able to be in the, the, the DC, uh, you know, a charging infrastructure and be able to really address large fleets. Proud to say the Postal Service selected us, as, for instance, as one of their providers for charging um, technology. When you look at that, it is capital intensive. And so the big question is, how do you set them up for success? And our expectation is that uh, by taking this kind of action, we actually give them the ability to control how they're going to raise the resources they need and, and, and give them the freedom to operate. $7.5 billion has been allocated for EV build-out from the Inflation Reduction Act. I think they might have built two dozen. Who does it better, the government or private sector? Well, this takes a combination. The investment that the government is making actually is starting the flywheel that gets us going. I think you've seen uh, for every federal dollar that's being spent, there's something like six or seven that are coming from the private sector. So we have seen that uptake increase. We are excited about bringing EVs onto the grid. We're excited about what it's going to do for us for resilience overall as we go.
One thing that we've been talking about as a theme on this show has been national security concerns and how to make uh, particularly the grid and aspects that are fundamental to the operating nation of society uh, invulnerable to some potential attack. How much is that a focus for you as you build this out, as you are the backbone for a lot of these projects? This is a huge, huge priority. And we've got something like 1,200 cyber experts across the country. Uh, as we develop new technology, we're clearly attending to this. But here's the thing, connected infrastructure is actually more secure. Right? If you're not connected, you just have no idea what's happening out there. Once you get connected, you can identify sources of threats. You can actually take action. And so we are big believers, and we've been working closely with our customers and with, the, with governments around the world, uh, getting our infrastructure more connected. Barbara, this was super smart. Let's do it again soon. It's good to see you. Looking Thanks for being here. Thank, Thank you, you. Barbara Humpton there of Siemens. We're going to need a lot of copper. And even more copper after the stimulus out of China. Very briefly, copper extending gains and hitting $10,000 a tonne for the first time since July. Lisa, copper up this morning by 1.7%. We're seeing the rally in precious metals as well, with uh, silver absolutely surging as well. So you have to imagine everything getting a boost from what we're seeing over from the China stimulus, but also this global melt-up, soft landing nirvana. You know, we got to build this somehow. Stocks up another 0.8% on the S&P 500 with an update on stories elsewhere this morning. With your Bloomberg Brief, here's Yahira Hackers. Hey, Yahira. Hi, John. The U.S. is sending additional aid to Ukraine. The Biden administration announced a new weapons package worth $375 million. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is expected to present President Joe Biden with his victory plan today, which will include a pathway to NATO membership. The Associated Press is reporting that billions more in aid will be announced later today as well. Meanwhile, Commerce Bank out with a new pledge to investors. The German lender vowing to boost profitability to $4 billion by 2027 and increase shareholder returns. The bank trying to boost investor support as it gears up for a potential takeover by Italian rival Unicredit. The incoming Commerce Bank CEO Bettina Orlop is expected to meet with Unicredit Friday. And OpenAI is discussing giving CEO Sam Altman a 7% equity stake in the company, marking the first time Altman is granted ownership in the AI startup. It's also discussing restructuring the AI leader to become a for-profit business. OpenAI is considering these changes against the backdrop of an exodus of senior managers, including Chief Technology Officer Mira Marotti. That's your Bloomer Brief. John. Yahara, thank you. More from Yahara in about 30 minutes' time. Up next on the program, the Fed giving markets the all clear. Powell is not going to let this economy have any kind of a hard landing, and so the market is just off to the races. It looks like if the economic data continues the way it is, they will do probably 25 in November, 25 in December. So what do you do if you're sitting in cash? Jerome Schneider of PIMCO, up next. Equities right now up by three quarters of one percent on the S&P 500. In the bond market, yields a little bit lower through most of this morning. We're down a basis point or two, 376.58. Under surveillance this morning, the Fed giving markets the all clear. Powell is not going to let this economy have any kind of a hard landing. And so the market is just off to the races. It looks like if the economic data continues the way it is, they will do probably 25 in November, 25 in December. I don't think they should be making these big cuts all right at the beginning. Let it work through a little bit. See where we stand. Fresh economic data just around the corner. Jobless claims at 8.30 Eastern time and a busy slate of Fed speak also on deck, including comments from Fed Chair Jay Powell. Jerome Schneider of PIMCO writing, the outlook for the U.S. remains solid, with growth still suggesting remote probabilities of a hard landing. Market pricing suggests a neutral rate of less than 3% will be achieved by the end of next year, something at odds with current data and PIMCO's outlook. Jerome's with us now for more. Jerome, it's good to see you. Good morning to you. Let's compare and contrast that with your outlook then. What's your outlook? So ultimately what we have is all the Fed speak that's going on. And unfortunately what we're finding is that the market remains more data dependent than the Federal Reserve at this point in time, reacting to individual discrete points of inflation and clearly growth and unemployment. Ultimately, that's going to be reconciled. But when we look at the survey, the landscape, Fed officials are going to be thinking about what's the proper unemployment rate that they are comfortable with. 
is that necessarily a linear trajectory? It probably isn't. And over that point in time, ultimately, what is the neutral rate that you have to get to, which facilitates a balanced economy? Now, there's a lot of conflict in that right now. The Federal Reserve thinks that's somewhere between 3 and 3.5 percent, something in line with what PIMCO believes. But yet the market suggests it's somewhere around 2 and 3 quarters percent. So that neutral rate actually is very divergent from that and almost suggesting that the economy or that the market right now is looking at a recessionary or hard landing for the economy. That's the construct of what we're dealing with right now. So market is interpreting, risk assets are interpre interpreting that, that the put, if you will, risk assets are going to be supported in the near term and longer term by the Federal Reserve, when in actuality, that road may not necessarily be as smooth as participants might encounter. So how do you think we'll resolve our differences? So ultimately, you're going to resolve your differences by rationalizing where growth is, how the economy develops. Admittedly, consumerism is very strong right now. You're going to see a third quarter G, uh, consumer print, about 3.5%, third quarter GDP. You know, you know, it's very sustainable at this point in time. And even PC, uh, PCEs over the next day or so when they're released are going to be slightly stronger than expected. That doesn't necessarily mean the economy is rolling over in the near term and may not necessarily elicit the function from the Federal Reserve that people think in the near term. Now, that doesn't mean you don't get to R-star. You eventually will. And so there are rate cuts. And so we have to be careful as practitioners at PIMCO, but also as individual investors to think about how that evolves. And that doesn't mean that you should be reacting to every single maneuvering in the front end of the market in the two-year note. We're not all Fed funds traders. We shouldn't be. We should look instead at the potential for price appreciation that is derived from Fed yields moving lower and prices moving higher. That's what's interesting out there right now at this point in time. So put all this together and basically you're saying maybe the Fed's not going to cut rates as quickly as people think just because the consumer is doing what the consumer does in America. It's going out and spending and it doesn't really impo impose some sort of recession on us. And then you write this. It's time to bail on bills. Yeah. If I were listening to you, there's a lot of risk out there and price to perfection, et cetera, that people talk about. Why shouldn't I be in bills then if the rates aren't going down so quickly and, you know, it kind of feels good? Listen, our job was tough at PIMCO for many years, zero rates. And then it became tougher for people in my sector that had the easy route of buying bills at 5% yield. That was the right trade for 2023 and the beginning of 2024. But what T-bills don't do at this point in time is have price appreciation. There is never a T-bill which has garnered price appreciation along the way. And fixed income works in a variety of ways. One, it's income. Clearly, that's a very different landscape than it was a few years ago. But the second component is use the tailwind of the Federal Reserve moving rates lower to have price appreciation within your fixed income construct. More importantly, it's a lower volatility type of impl implement, implementation within your portfolio. Are you basically saying forget T-bills, right. go to one year to your corporate notes or something like that that have, gets a price have appreciation? Have a more diversified portfolio. Here's one thing that's really interesting. When you look at a money market fund, when you look at T-bills, we've already seen that recalibration. We've already seen T-bill yields move lower by 40 to 50 basis points overnight based upon the Federal Reserve. We've already seen money market funds evaporate. The headline yield on a money market fund might read 4.8%, but the chances of you getting that return is very remote over the course of next year. It's going to be most likely 3%. So find the balance of having some total return, which benefits from the price appreciation in bonds. And to do that, you need to step out of that curve. How hard is it to give people that message while also saying this is a time to remain liquid, it, to be nimble? It's incredibly hard because when you think about the history of utilization of people reacting to changes in the Fed funds benchmark, easing of monetary policy, it takes 12 to 24 months for people to move out of money market funds to do that. People are going to, if that happens, the expectation of where rates are a year from now is 2.75% currently. You're missing out on 200 basis points, 2% of opportunity for your cash. That's the reality of it. So maybe you decide that T-bills aren't worth it, but the reality is people don't, it doesn't resonate with people until after the fact. That's why it's so urgent to have people react to not just the daily data that comes out, but also let's take a moment back, breathe, and see what's really happening in the landscape of investing. I'm at taking this a point deep breath. I have one more question because I'm still confused. Okay, so let's go back to the start of the interview. If you think the market is priced for neutral below your estimates, I'm trying to work out how we reconcile that and get price appreciation in bonds at the same time. Sure. Where does that come from as we close that gap? There's Where's the sweet spot on the curve? There's a couple things. One, don't be so tactical that you're going to react to every single data point at this point in time. Number two, the starting point for fixed income is positive real returns, meaning you're going to earn a positive after inflation return at this point in time of 1.5% or something in that regard. 
fixed income is attractive in that regard. So don't get caught up in the minutia of here, uh, you know, the Fed funds rate is going to be expected to be X today and it should be really Y. Instead, the, the gradual move lower of benchmark rates will provide that tailwind of price appreciation. We haven't completed that. That's the key difference, John, Jonathan. And when we, when we get that, you're going to see bond prices move higher. And when you add layers of diversification through corporate bonds, mortgage securities, things like that, the step out of cash, timing, timing to bail on bills, is incredibly prudent right now. Got it. Jerome, appreciate it. Clinic, as always. Thank you, sir. Jerome Schneider of PIMCO. You up to speed? Oh, that I felt like a clinic, great. right? Deep breath. Yeah, well, it's just, it just the difference between putting it in a money market and putting it in a managed fund that actually goes into things that have a price that trades. It's sort of the difference. Big difference. Coming up, Jim Caron and Morgan Stanley, Jakob Stasson of Rio Tinto, Jay Bryson of Wells Fargo, Cassie Barrow of JP Morgan, and finally, look out for this one, Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, stacked third hour of Bloomberg surveillance, up next. look at some other areas of the labor market, not just the payroll number. The slowdown in the labor market would not be a great thing because that tends to not be something that turns very quickly. I think markets are now laser focused on this job section. The labor market is balanced. Inflation readings have come down. I think the biggest risk is not necessarily inflation picking up. That could be part of it, but more of a melt up in markets. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Big hour coming up on this program, 8.30 Eastern time, jobless claims just around the corner. Going into it, equities, session highs up eight tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq 100, quite a run. A big pop up by 1.5%, encouraged by the move with Micron after the close yesterday, but also the latest out of China, just a rip roaring rally out of Chinese equities once again this morning. Given the fact that now they're coming out with fiscal stimulus, people were wondering how far they were willing to take this. Right now, it seems like much further than many people had expected. Analysts initially saying, this isn't a bazooka. Next day, this isn't a bazooka. Now, maybe it is a bazooka. We don't know what's coming up next. The key is to understand what the thinking is and why now. Stronger Chinese currency. Copper ripping as well, briefly through 10K for the first time since July. And Marie Copper this morning at 1.75%. Copper up, as Lisa is talking to, a number of base metals, precious metals going higher. What is going on in China? This is good for the market, except for oil. That is the one place where in the commodity space you really don't see a rise in prices. And why? We potentially are going to have a price war on our hands in just a few months, Jonathan. Will jobless claims spoil the party? Let's talk about jobless claims. The data drops in 28 minutes' time. The estimate our survey, 223, the previous number, 219. After you get that data point, you have got a ton of Fed speak today, including Chairman Powell and New York Fed President John Williams. Claims is the big one. Especially given the fact that everyone just keeps saying that this is a market that hinges entirely on the labor market. Jerome Schneider of PIMCO just said something really interesting. This market is more data dependent than this Federal Reserve. Right now, this market is more hinged to the idea of soft landing nirvana than anything more of a wobble, which could be potentially represented in jobless claims or beyond. That, to me, is the biggest hang up at a time where otherwise it's basically firing guns on all sides. Let's go, let's go, let's go. When it comes to data dependency, UBS's Paul Donovan puts out a note this morning talking about this increased frequency. Size of data revisions underscores the dangers of being data dependent and in driving policy. So when you get obsessed with the data, how concerning is that when basically in a week or two time you find out there's a lot of revisions? And this is the issue we've all got. You've just got to assume the data's worse than it actually is when it comes in. And that's the bias of this market at the moment as well. Yeah, which story do you pay attention to? And I think that that's sort of when you start talking about Micron, it comes out better than expected earnings. People are spending maybe a revival of personal computers and smartphones. On the flip side, uh, I thought it was interesting that Disney is doing another round of corporate layoffs. You see just the idea of efficiency. How do you maintain margins? We were talking yesterday about the paddling duck of corporate earnings earnings to keep margins uh, at a decent price. This was Lisa Coleman from J.P. Morgan Asset Management. There just is uncertainty from companies in addition to the macro data, and it has been trending lower. You can't discount that at a time where some people are just getting carried away with soft lighting nirvana, myself included this morning, because how could you not? I know you sound very optimistic. It's almost jarring. You mentioned Lisa Coleman. I've got the quote in front of me. Companies have been working hard to maintain margins by maximizing efficiencies wherever possible. Layoffs have not been and are not anticipated near term to be used. When they are, 
this story changes. And when they are, you've already pushed all the levers far enough that it doesn't just end up being a one-time thing. You end up with not a lot more to cut. And that is not a scenario that the Fed wants to get to. Question that we've been asking is, how effective are these rate cuts in actually preventing that versus, you know, if it already is going to happen, it's going to happen, right? But we won't know until it already happened. And so I'm talking about a downturn. And that's the reason why jobless claims will be the seminal moment of today. At the moment, things are so good. Even Lisa's bullish. Equities are up by three quarters of one percent on the S&P 500 in the bond market yield to lower by two basis points the 10-year 376.58 coming up this hour Jim Karen and Morgan Stanley and why he's keeping a close eye on the labor market Jakob home of Rio Tinto as base metals advance on Chinese stimulus and NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg as Ukraine pushes for continued Western support we begin this hour with equities heading back to all-time highs investors looking for the next catalyst including remarks from Fed Chair Jay Powell and jobless claims Less than 30 minutes away. Jim Carron and Morgan Stanley has a warning for the bulls. The labor market may be weaker than reported numbers imply. It may mean they want to cut aggressively, but inflation may not allow them to do so. The U.S. may encounter a period of diminished countercyclical monetary and fiscal policy tools to buffer future shocks to the economy. Jim joins us now for more. Jim, talk about killing the mood, buddy. How bearish are you based on that quote? Well, I, I'm not bearish. Believe it or not, I'm actually, um, you know, somewhat optimistic, and our positioning reflects that. We are, you know, slightly overweight on, on, on the equity side. But my concern is about the future, right? How long can this actually continue? And where my concern is is that Fed policy, their what we call their policy reaction function, is based on a series of data which is the employment data, which we know has been heavily revised lower consistently. Even the March over March uh, numbers were revised down 840,000, you know, over that one year, 12 month period of time. And the Fed is trying to defend a 4.4% unemployment rate. And plus, you know, we have immigration and all the COVID related um, uncertainties that are still coming through the marketplace today. So the policy reaction function is, is really trying to focus on employment data where we don't even really fully have a good grasp of the whole, like of the real population of the U.S., a working population of the U.S. due to immigration, I would argue that the data would suggest that the unemployment rate is actually higher than what's being reported right now. And if you look at the confidence number, you know, jobs hard to get versus jobs easy to get, that was one of the key deterioration components. So, we're, so yes, the labor market is tight today. It's strong today. But the go forward indicators would suggest that the unemployment rate is likely at a higher level than what we're seeing today. And it's going to be really hard for the Fed to defend a 4.4 percent unemployment rate. So, Jim, let's work through this. The risk is the data is worse than we think it is. Even worse. One. Two, we're overestimating our ability to deal with it. So let's talk about what you do in equity markets. You came on at the start of August when everyone was freaking out about that July jobs report. And you said this is an opportunity to buy. Why isn't this an opportunity to sell, given what you've just said? Yeah, so, so, so effectively what we have done is we've taken down our, our, our overweight inequities towards a more neutral level. I'd say it's still tilted towards some risk on. So we, we have taken some of that risk, uh, you know, risk down. The reason why really has to do with margins. So what's happening right now in, 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 in jobs? Remember, the economy and markets can be very, very different. So what's happening right now in terms of earnings and multiples and cash flows going forward is that labor costs are likely to come down because of everything that I'm saying. Yet the overall economic run rate, you know, GDP might be 3% in, in the third quarter is still reasonably good. So you have corporations with their biggest source of cost, which is usually labor, which is starting to come lower is actually starting to preserve those margins and making those earnings in the future more valuable and people are willing to pay a higher multiple. So if you look at, for example, consensus 2025 earnings for equities, call it around $280, and you still keep a multiple of 20 or 21 around that, then you're looking at S&P 500 numbers that could go up towards, you know, 5,800, 5,900, and, and possibly even a, a little bit higher than that. So it's really hard to actually push against that and, and, and be very bearish on equities at the moment until, as Lisa was saying, you start to see a real deterioration in the labor market and then you get loss of consumption and that could create a, uh, you know, more layoffs and, and, and more decline in margin. But we're not there yet. It's a question of the timing. Jim, what do you sell? 
and this is something that people have been grappling with, which aspects of a market that are, that's broadly thought to be overvalued? Well, I have an unpopular answer. And what I think that you sell is fixed income. And the reason I say that is that if I look at bond yields, like not, not, not short duration bond yields necessarily, but, but longer duration bond yields out to 10 years around index duration, say six years of duration. I think that bonds have priced in over 250 basis points of rate cuts already. So what we've been selling down, where we've been taking some, some, some chips off the table is in reducing our fixed income. Bond yields came down. We think that they're priced for over 250 basis points of rate cuts. Um, and I don't really think that they're going to go down materially more unless we have a hard landing. We are in the soft landing camp. So the risk could be that you end up with a Fed that might not be able to cut rates as much, yet the mark bond market, the interest rate markets are already priced in that space. And even in high yield, I mean, you know, we've been overweight high yield all year. And we're thinking now about taking that down just because high yield yields have come down towards a around 7% and there's not much excess return over treasuries once you account for default risk that makes the high yield asset class as attractive as what we had thought. So we're actually reducing some of that interest rate and duration risk and spread risk within, um, within fixed income. Just to put a bow on it, John read this line from your research that I thought was really interesting, that the U.S. may encounter a period of diminished counter-cyclical monetary and fiscal policy tools to buffer future shocks to the economy. You went on to say that this could increase risk premia broadly across assets. Is this more true for treasuries? And are treasuries now considered a risk asset at a time when potentially there are other factors in addition to inflation, but also the deficit kind of hanging over the profile? Yeah, I, I think it's all connected. So, so, so effectively, when I say that we, we could en enter a period of reduced fiscal and monetary, countercyclical monetary and fiscal policy, really what I'm highlighting is that, you know, if we look at mortgages, mortgage rates, you know, people People have mortgages, you know, likely already. Cutting rates doesn't necessarily release a lot of spending from the, you know, from the household sector because not as many people are going to refinance. Bond yields are already relatively low, so that's already accounted for. On the fiscal side, the, the U.S. deficit is between six and seven percent. I don't care who the next president is; it's going to be really hard to spend money. Um, so the ability to have like an America Rescue Plan if there's a downturn, or the ability to cut corporate tax rates to boost the economy in that sense is going to be really hard no matter who gets the next job. So what that means is if we put it all together on the monetary side and also on the fiscal side, that it's going to be hard to generate stimulus if we have a bigger downturn. What it also means is that at the margin, bond yields may not go down as much as what we had experienced in the past you know, few decades you know, in response to these you know, kinds of events. So it does put a higher risk, I wouldn't call treasuries a risk asset, but I, I would say that it does put a higher risk premium on treasuries, and it means that investors need to demand a, a slightly higher yield these days, and that creates a higher overall yield construct for markets. Jim, this was really thoughtful. Super thoughtful. Appreciate it, as always, sir. Jim Caron there of Morgan Stanley. Let's give an update on stories elsewhere this morning with your Bloomberg Brief. Here's your Hira Hackers. Hey, Yahira. Hi, John. The New York Times is reporting that early this morning, federal agents raided Gracie Mansion. That's the official residence of New York City Mayor Eric Adams. The search coming after sources told Bloomberg the mayor had been indicted following a corruption investigation. A source says the indictment is likely to be unsealed later today and the charges against him will be made public. Meanwhile, Southwest Airlines is getting a lift in the pre-market. The company raised its third quarter forecast and announced a new $2.5 billion stock buyback program as part of its turnaround plan. Activist investor Elliott Investment slammed the carrier's recovery strategy as being reckless and chaotic and said it would continue to seek a board overhaul as tensions mount over the airline's future. And the race for the final playoff spots in the National League will have to wait as Hurricane Helene hits the Southeast. The remaining games in the critical series between the Mets and the Braves have been postponed and will be played in a doubleheader next Monday. The Braves currently hold a 1-0 lead in that series. The storm is forecast to strike Florida's Big Bend region as a major hurricane later today. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Yahira, thank you. Appreciate it. Up next on the program, The Morning Calls Plus, Rio Tinto CEO, Jakob Stelsheim, as Chinese stimulus sends base metals much higher. That conversation just around the corner. From New York, good morning.
The opening bell, one hour and 15 minutes away with an equity market lift here on the S&P 500 up by three quarters of 1%. In the bond market, Lisa, yields are lower by two basis points. Jobless claims just around the corner. Could it kill the mood where you see yields going lower for the wrong reasons and that sending potentially risk assets lower? And that is, I think, where people are on tenterhooks to find out whether they can actually just lean into soft lighting nirvana. You're not killing the mood. You're sort of on board with this move, aren't you? I mean, honestly, give me a reason not to be. Hard I think to fight. You could, I mean, honestly, I think that revision history uh, is something that people are pointing to, including Andrew Holland Horse just came out and said, typically you get these downward revisions in, in a bad time and just wait, just wait until it really comes out. So, you know, I have to, I have to temper it. Everyone messaging their broker, Bramo's bullish. I don't know what to do. So it's a big change. <laughs> it's a big change. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Jeffrey's downgrading Hershey to underperform and kind of gets price target to a street low 163. The analyst citing weak chocolate sales. The stock is down 1.8%. Your second call from Bernstein upgrading Starbucks to outperform. The firm saying market optimism since the appointment of a new CEO is fully warranted. We're up 2.9% there. And finally, Loop Capital raising its price target on Wayfair by $10 to 55 and keeping a hold rating. The firm saying lower interest rates will eventually benefit home-related sales. Turning to commodities, a new wave of stimulus out of China fueling expectations for metals. Copper briefly rallying back towards $10,000 a tonne and crossing that level. China's Politburo calling for a forceful rate cut and a backstop to the country's real estate market. Rio Tinto CEO Jakob Stasholm joins us here in New York. Jakob, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Thank Fantastic you. news for you, sir. This makes your trip to New York so much better. Four-day rally on the stock. I think we're up by more than 10% over that period. Can we start with China? What do you make from what you've heard so far? And do you think it makes a big enough difference to your business? Well, first of all, China is the manufacturing hub of the world. And therefore, uh, the economy uh, is hugely important for commodity prices. And China is managing its economy uh, very uh, metic meticulously. And uh, what you see now is that we know that the property sector has had a very tough time. Uh, the manufacturing sector is actually still growing quite a lot, but as they have a target of 5% this year, they clearly have deemed it necessary to uh, come up with some stimulus. And um, we've seen this again and again over the last couple of decades, uh, and they're able to, to achieve their targets. It's, it's quite impressive, 5% on a very big economy. Their approach is shifting, it's evolving. We're hearing more about fiscal stimulus. As you look at your business, iron ore, and copper. Can you walk us through how strong or weak the demand has been over the last few months? But the demand has been good. Uh, and we, we, we have good demand. The steel mills in China are running flat out. Uh, but I think what you can see is that the steel mill is probably producing a bit more than what the domestic demand is. And that's why you see record uh, export of steel. And you have to ask yourself, is that sustainable? So stimulus, particularly if it goes into infrastructure, is good for the steel mills who are my customers and therefore good for us. Do you have a sense of where the demand is coming from? It used to be just it was directly correlated to China, but now <laughs> everyone seems to be building out their infrastructure and trying to fortify and create extra kinds of infrastructure pipelines to uh, prevent against some sort of supply chain disruption. How much is it actually shifting away from China? Yeah, um, there are other economies that are really booming. For example, the Indian economy, and that drives, that drives quite a lot. And uh, then there's different types of infrastructure. So for example, the, uh, the energy transition is also about building new infrastructure, building a new energy infrastructure. And if you look at the Chinese economy, that actually boosts their, their growth quite a lot. I want to talk about one of the reasons you're here and whether this quote from the Vice President Kamala Harris's music to your ears. I want to share it with our audience. They're vowing to create a national stockpile of metals to bolster domestic production and security. This was the statement from the campaign. Increased domestic production will be paired with innovative and sustainable steps to build stronger critical mineral supply chains alongside our allies and partners, including by incentivizing investments that expand US and allied production of these resources. Let's pause. Resolution Copper, Arizona. I'm not sure how many people in this country realize we have a deposit that could supply up to 25% of America's copper demand. Where are we with that joint venture with BHP? So uh, we're trying to progress the project, uh, but it has been 
uh, for permitting for the last 12 years. So it's it's a long process. Uh, we hope we are uh, towards the end and we can get the land swap going. We're still, and that's very, very important, working with uh, the 11 uh, First Nations around. We need to be sure of that we end up with a solution that uh, that they are comfortable with. But from a, from a permitting point of view, I would say we are uh, towards the end of the process. And you're absolutely right. It is a magnificent uh, ore body, a copper ore body. It can produce for decades 25% of the needs of copper in the US. And on top of that, Rio Tinto is one of only two companies who has a, 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 a copper smelter. So we can not only extract the copper concentrate, but we can actually manufacture the final copper here in this country. But how do you square what Kamala Harris and her campaign are saying with the fact that it was the Biden administration last year that put the brakes on the mine? Uh, yeah, I'm not in politics, uh, but what I think is interesting with the statement you just read for me is it's a little bit like uh, in the 70s uh, when there was an energy pr crisis, people started stocking uh, uh, oil. And uh, I think the learnings from COVID is that a little bit more supply chain uh, security is important for industry. We are happy to, to, to support that and, and that might be also including uh, some kind of stockpilings, etc., to make sure that you just cannot have effective industry unless you have a secure supply chain. You're still dealing with just the permitting of this project. When could we actually see it working? <laughs> yeah, the, it's a long process. Uh, the, where we are now is that we are in the, in the place of uh, uh, need to have a land swap so that we, uh, some of it is federal land, we have agreed how we can swap with some other land so that we have the whole land. Then we can finalize the environmental um, all the uh, environmental uh, impact uh, consultations, consultations with local communities, and then we can start executing a project. So we are talking towards the end of, uh, of, of the decade uh, that we can have production. But then we will have production for the next 60 years. How much more expensive is it to produce something like copper in the US than say uh, some of the other mines that are already in existence? So that's an interesting question. That's actually not so much whether it's in the US or elsewhere. It depends on the quality of the ore body. In this case, the resolution has a, has a, a grade of three, three and a half percent copper. Many uh, copper mines have got just 0.5 percent. And that means you have to extract many more tons to get the same amount of tons of copper. So it can actually be quite efficient uh, uh, extracting copper in Arizona. We're working our way around the world. I want to go down to Argentina, to the Rincon Lithium Project. I think you paid almost $900 million, $800 million for this yeah. a couple of years back. You've met Millet this week from Argentina. How's that all going? Look, um, I think that there's a lot of opportunities in Argentina. Uh, they have been through some really, really tough years, and I hope the government will succeed uh, on... Uh, reducing the inflation, stabilizing the economy, and ultimately get, get growth in the economy. We are very happy with a few of the initiatives that the government have done, uh, such as uh, the so-called Ricky legislation, incentivizing uh, uh, major foreign investments. That helps us. We will, with our investment, we will produce first lithium by December this year, but we are likely to take a big expansion uh, uh, for, for sanction in December as well. That could be another $2 billion investment into Argentina. And in the past, it has not been without risks to invest in, in Argentina, also because you've got the currency restrictions. But um, we are seeing Argentina heading in the right direction. So uh, I wish the government uh, success. We are very aligned on, on that interest. Let's finish on lithium. If I think about the arc of your company over the last decade plus, I think back to Sam Walsh coming out of the China boom. He had to deal with that. John Sebastian Jack had to do the cleanup. He had to do the value over volume push. That meant pulling back on, on spending in a big way. You had to come on board and put out a lot of fires. I'm trying to work out from your perspective now, as you start to carve out the business and really start to put your footprint, handprint on things. The business mix, historically, taking out coal, we're talking iron ore, copper and aluminum. Where's lithium fit in in years to come? Do I call this a lithium business in 10 years from now? How big could that be? Lithium will always be small compared to copper and, uh, and aluminium, but that's not what you should think about. You should think about that lithium is very small today and a number of new mines will have to be developed in order to meet the demand. If you want to electrify societies, you will need batteries, you will need lithium. 
and we have the technology, we have the capabilities, so why not chip in there? It can, I believe, it can be quite substantial, but it will never be as big as, as for example, the aluminium market. Hopefully we can do this again soon. It's good to catch up, sir. Appreciate you. your time. Thank you. Jakob Stasson there of Rio Tinto. Up next on this program, we've got a lot to talk about. Jobless claims just around the corner, 8.30 Eastern time. A lot of Fed speak as well. We'll speak to Jay Bryson of Wells Fargo and Kelsey Barrow of JP Morgan Asset Management, both here to react from New York City this morning. Good morning. Your data is up next. The main event this morning for the equity market, jobless claims just seconds away. So let's start with equity futures on the S&P 500. There's a lift across the board here, up by eight tenths of 1%. On the Nasdaq 100, up by 1.5. On the Russell, up by one full percentage point. This could change in 10 seconds time. In the bond market, yields look like this. A two year, 10 year, 30 year, shaping up as follows. The two year down about two basis points at the moment to 353. 26. If you're looking at the 10 year, we're down two or three basis points to 375.64. And to finish on a 30 year yield, down two or three basis points to about 411. Ton of data across in the Bloomberg screen at the moment. What we're looking for is jobless claims. 223 is the estimate in our survey. The previous week is 219. And what we get is 218. 218 on jobless claims. I think we just have to pause here. 218 at any time going back decades is tremendously low for jobless claims, historically low. So at a time when we're really worried about the next step in this economy and the evolution of the American economy being layoffs, people getting fired and claims rising, we just don't see it in the data right now. We do not see it at all. The jobless claims coming in at the lowest going back to May 17th, the weekend of May, May 17th, 2024, at the same time that we're getting the second revision uh, in the first quarter GDP upward, actually now, uh, and it basically is showing ongoing strength. So big question here, is there still the boogeyman lurking out there, which is the slowdown in the labor market that we're going to see in non-farm payrolls or the jobless claims just telling us stop looking for it because it just isn't showing up? So let's push it through the market. Let's start with equities. Equities up across the board. Still, that move sticks. Equities up on the S&P, up by 8 tenths on the Nasdaq, up by 1.5. Let's flip up the board, switch up the board, turn the page and get to the bond market story. The two-year yield was lower. The 10-year yield was lower. Now the two years just a little bit higher. So that's the change off the back of this in the last 90 seconds. Push that through foreign exchange. Dollar a little bit stronger. Euro dollar backing off session highs, 111.48. Just remember, payrolls a week tomorrow. The estimates 140. I think the survey week was last week. So this is what we're looking at for, for next month. Payrolls, is it really going to slow down anytime soon, given what we've seen coming out of the jobless claims numbers over the last month or so? If jobless claims are the best high-frequency indicator, the answer would be no. At the same time, people have pointed to the fact that you're not seeing jobs getting created. It's not just maybe people getting fired, but that people aren't actually getting the opportunities, and you are seeing that in some of the sentiment surveys. However, there is a discrepancy between the bearishness and the fears versus what we're seeing in the claims numbers, and I think that that's what you're feeling in terms of the lift in yields on the margins uh, in the bond market today. Jay Bryson of Wells Fargo with us now to discuss. Jay, I just love your thoughts on jobless claims at 218. It just screams there's nothing to see here. Everything's okay. Is everything okay? Well, you know, so the, you know, the, you talk about payrolls coming out, yep. um, right? And so payrolls is a net number. It's, you know, it's two gross numbers. What we're getting today in the initial jobless claims is people who are losing jobs. What Lisa was just talking about is creating jobs. And so when you look at the economy, we're not creating a lot of jobs. We're not losing a lot of jobs either. And so when you get that net number out uh, next week, you know, we're 135, so there has been a slowdown in job creation, and what that means is you're just not going to have as much income growth going forward as well. Is it inevitable that layoffs are next? I don't think it's necessarily inevitable, because if you look at the financial health of most businesses today, that's actually pretty good. You know, their balance sheets are pretty strong. Their debt service uh, ratios for most companies are very, very strong as well. And so they don't necessarily need to lay people off at this point. But, you know, if monetary policy remains restrictive here, uh, that's going to continue to put headwinds on, on growth. And that eventually potentially could lead to those jobless claims going up. 
Do you get the sense that this market is too complacent about uh, this sort of soft landing nirvana, as we've named it? Or is uh, this more uh, an economy that's uh, at risk of a reacceleration that people maybe are a little bit overly complacent about the inflation side of the equation? So, you know, if you say, um, what's more likely going forward? Slow down, more of a slowdown from here or more of a reacceleration? I'm going to take the more of a slowdown um, sort of story right now. Just again, because monetary policy remains restrictive right here. I just don't see a re re huge reacceleration right here. And so, you know, when I think about the risk of recession in the next 12 months or so, you know, the underlying run rate is like 15%. You know, if you said to me, what do you think the risk of recession in the next 12 months is? One in three, thirty percent, thirty-five percent. It's not our base case, but we're not out of the woods, right? I mean, you are seeing signs of stress in the household sector. You're seeing delinquencies on credit cards going up. You're seeing delinquencies on auto loans going up, and uh, people's you know the, the excess money they had after you know the stimulus programs are all gone at this point. And so you could get you you could get a move to the downside here, although I'm not really expecting that. If that's the case, why shouldn't the uh, Fed go by 50 basis points in November? I think there's a very good, very good case for that, but I think it's going to be. I think you were saying earlier, it's all you know. We're just very, very data dependent at this point, and um, you know, it's, it's they're trying to balance the risk out there. And you know, could you get a reacceleration? Sure, I don't think it's the most likely case, but you know, um, there's that still that possibility there. And I don't think they want to go 50 to have to have to reverse that. A few, you know, a few months from now. Well, reverse that because of policy out of Washington in 2025? So I don't think you're going to get a huge policy shift out of Washington in 2025. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing that Congress has to deal with next year is the extension of the, uh, you know, the TCJA at the end of the year. And are, the debt we, are, we, are we expecting that right off the bat? Probably not, right? That doesn't expire until the end of the year. Knowing Congress is going to take them a long time to do that. But I guess what about reacceleration of inflation if it came to things like tariffs. If it comes to things like tariff, you, you could potentially see that. Now, does that mean the Fed starts to raise rates? I think the Fed, net, you know, if you were to get a reacceleration in inflation, I think the Fed goes on hold. Everyone's pricing in 200 basis points of rate cuts. That probably goes away. But I think the Fed initially would, would say, wait on hold and see how much it feeds through. The bulls are getting everything they want over the last week. A 50 basis point cut from the Federal Reserve, Bramo, a read of about 220,000 on jobless claims. Stimulus out of China. What more do you want right now? Does it get much better than this? I mean, the only thing it would have to be would be some sort of disinflationary shock, like oil prices <laughs> falling down. Oh, wait a second. That's actually happening because guess what? There might be a race to the bottom now in terms of trying to preserve market share. So look, yes, it does feel I'm going to be a broken record like soft landing nirvana. However, and sort of the silver, the, the sort of Fly in the ointment, if you if you would, is this question around what are we missing and revisions have been lower. And that's the reason why uh, that is going to be the ongoing focus and we're not totally out of the woods. People can still pretend to worry until non from payrolls. Your jobs report a week tomorrow. We are still vulnerable to one data point in this market. It goes the wrong way, this market turns. Do you think we're getting less vulnerable, though, given all of the stimulus and the sort of rate-cutting cycle from around the world? I mean, there is sort of a feeling of... It certainly uh, helps. Yeah, I think that there is less fragility in some of the confidence that people have today than they did, say, even a week ago. 218 on jobless claims. We were looking for 223. Yields are up by two basis points on a two-year 358. Jay Bryson and Wells Fargo. Jay, thank you, sir. It's good thank to you. see you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bit of news for you in the last few minutes. The number's 25 billion. Citigroup, Apollo, joining forces in a $25 billion private credit push. With the latest, let's get across the Bloomberg. Shanali Basak. Hey, Shanali. Hey, John. You have a landmark deal happening in the world of private credit, of course, a fast-booming industry, along with one of the top global investment banks in the world. What you'll have here is Citigroup teaming up with Apollo, which is the largest direct lender of its kind, as you know, in order to provide $25 billion worth of financing here. The idea here is that Citigroup would or look to originate the deal flow, take a fee off of that flow, and Apollo and its partners would provide the capital. Among those partners is Abu Dhabi's Mubadala, of course, a very prominent sovereign wealth fund that has been taking a bigger role in the world of private credit. But of course, fundamentally, this brings together two teams that had have, have had very close ties over time. You may remember Apollo's own co-president, Jim Zelter, used to run that team 
over at Citigroup that dealt with leverage finance and high yield financing. You now have Citigroup in a position where they are the number two investment grade underwriter in the United States, but they have not met the top five this year. When you look at high yield and leverage loans, presumably this will help them reach more clients in order to do so with giving Apollo many more deals to finance and of course corporations as well. Zelter has told us that they expect to do about five billion dollars worth of deals in the first year and both teams are looking to keep the door open here to expand this beyond 25 billion dollars. Shnali, appreciate it. Thanks for the update. City up in early trading. Looking ahead to a big conversation around Apollo for next week. So watch this space. Our friend Jim Zouter over at Apollo saying this. This is where the industry is going. City goes from a very active M&A banker with a few tools, Lisa, to having the complete toolbox. And it comes as a lot of the big banks have been questioning exactly how they can fit into the behemoth that is private credit that's been expanding and continue to keep some of the business that used to be squarely in some of those large banks. This is a solution, I guess. Watch this space. Plenty of discussions on this with Shanali at the top of the hour in about 20 minutes' time. I want to turn back to the price action, up eight-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Moments ago, we had jobless claims data out of America. We were looking for that number because that number really separates right now the equity market bulls and the bears. Comes in weak. At the moment, the bears are going to jump on board and say, look, things are turning lower in the economy. Comes in strong. The bulls are justified to be long stocks. Came in strong, 218, 218, Lisa, versus an estimate of 223. And the response is everything is up in particular. You've got the Russell 2000 up more than a percent. Uh, as you've got yields just creeping a little bit higher, you do wonder how high the bar is now to get the bears to reemerge from the woods because they are kind of hiding at this point. Uh, and so there's a real question here of would it now just take one bad non-farm payrolls to get people spooked once again about the idea of some sort of downturn? Let's get to Kelsey Barrow of JP Morgan Asset Management. Kelsey, good morning to you. Good morning. How vulnerable are we to a soft print on payrolls two Fridays away? Well, there's there's two things to consider. One is how vulnerable are we, and then you know what is most likely to occur. So the initial jobless claims today suggest that the expansion should continue. The labor market is healthy. Now, if you were to ask me where the balance of risks is, I would say the balance of risks is to the downside. It is to this to the risk that payrolls growth slows more and the unemployment rate rises. You know, I know there's this debate. If the, if the Fed sees payrolls growth below 100,000, then that's the green light to do another 50. I think we forget that we already had a payrolls print below 100,000 two months ago. So payrolls growth already is slowing. Now, this is the most new information that I feel like I've learned in the past few days in terms of Fed communication is that actually, while the market is focused on the debate about 25 versus 50 being primarily about the labor market, some participants are actually opening up the door to additional 50 basis point rate cuts just on inflation alone. And that's why I think you know, you're not going to necessarily see materially higher yields just because the, you know, the labor market stays around here. There are other reasons yields should remain low and should be biased lower be because of the inflation backdrop alone. Just to back up, was that Governor Waller that made you start thinking that way? It was, although to be fair, you know, we've been thinking about it this way for a while, which is that the Fed has justification to cut probably 100 to 150 basis points just on the improvement in inflation alone. And then you couple that with what we're seeing in terms of inflation expectations, inflation break-evens, the commodity complex, the global growth backdrop, and I think they can feel fairly confident that there is space for them to ease, and that's kind of agnostic to, does the labor market stabilize around here or does it continue to move lower? One of the most controversial aspects of your whole uh, case is that you see this as a reason to buy bonds across the entire yield spectrum. When people come on this show, they have increasingly said, I'm comfortable with it up, up until about five years, and then after that, forget it, because I have no idea what's going to happen, and potentially we could get even inflation coming back or being stickier because of a proactive Fed. How do you push back against that? Because I'm sure you hear that a lot. 
Well, I mean, when you think about what we are recommending that clients do here, what we've found when we look at the client base is that despite the fact that the Fed has finally come in after 14 months of being on hold and cut rates 50 basis points, there are still many clients that are under allocated to, uh, to fixed income and over allocated to cash. And so there is still a lot of move, room to move out in terms of duration. Now, in terms of how I think the term structure of the yield curve is going to evolve, I do think that the curve is biased steeper. So you are going to see front end yields move lower than long end yields uh, as the Fed continues to deliver those rate cuts. But I do think that when you're thinking about building a portfolio that has diversification, you can think about a core or core plus fund with a five or six year duration, which is what you're going to get when you buy one of those full bond funds that invests across the whole maturity spectrum. And that's gonna give you both the income and also the benefit of capital appreciation if the claims data is, is not the real signal, and in fact, the terminal rate for the Fed is not three, but lower. In this picture, there's a real question about if you're more biased to the potential for downside risk, why should you go into riskier assets? So I think there's a couple reasons. Uh, first of all, all of this in terms of the timing and transmission of monetary policy is very uncertain. Uh, the lags are very unclear. So we do feel like we're getting closer to reaching an inflection point, but it's not clear which way the economy is going to break. So on one hand, the Fed cuts 50 basis points, and in 12 months, if they succeed in extending the cycle, we could be looking at reacceleration. In that case, you know, spread should remain very tight here. On the other hand, if this is like every other time in history, then the 50 basis point cut is actually not um, a proactive move that extend the cycle, but a signal that they're already too late. And to balance those things, I think you need both a combination of duration and high quality, but also some carry in your portfolio because the, the outcomes, uh, both tail risks are possible at this moment. Kelsey, we've got to leave it there. It's always great to catch up. Thank you. Kelsey Burrow there of JP Morgan Asset Management. We count you down to the opening bell. 45 minutes away, equities are still high by eight tenths of 1% off the back of that better than expected jobless claims number. Yields just a little bit higher. Up next on the program, we'll run you through the day ahead and we'll catch up with this man right here. A conversation you do not want to miss. The NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, right here in New York City. Up next. As we count you down to the opening bell, here's the trading diary. The week ahead, the day ahead looks like this. A flu slew of Fed speak on deck. We hear from Collins, Kugler Bowman, Williams, Barr, Cook, Kashkari, and Fed Chair Jay Powell. Then Costco reporting after the closing bell and the UN General Assembly still ongoing. This is President Biden and Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. A meeting in DC this afternoon. Joining us now around this table, I'm really pleased to say the outgoing NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg departing the organization after a decade. Sarah, it's good to see you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for sharing what I believe is your final interview in yes. the job. Thank yeah. you, sir. You've been very kind to Bloomberg over the years, and every time we've spoken to you over the last decade, you've always been generous with your time. So thank you. Thank you for that. If I think back at your tenure over the last decade, I can think of two really big wake-up calls for the organisation. One was Trump being elected in 2016 mm. and really putting the foot on the throat of some of the people who are part of this organisation to spend more on defence. Mm. The other was the invasion of Russia into Ukraine more recently in the last couple of years. As you step back and think about your tenure the last decade, what stood out for you? The most, uh, of course, decisive and, uh, and uh, as I say, uh, important uh, challenge we faced was the Russian full-scale invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. But we have to remember that the war in Ukraine didn't start in 2022. It started in 2014 when Russia went in and took Crimea. And since then, uh, over the last uh, decade, NATO has implemented the biggest enforcement of collective defense because of Russia's annexation of Crimea. So when the full-scale invasion happened in 22, we were prepared. We had more forces uh, on high readiness, for the first time battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance. So when it happened, uh, the full-scale invasion, we were able to step up our support for Ukraine and increase our military presence uh, in, uh, in the eastern part of the alliance. So, Ukraine has been there throughout my tenure, uh, but it has gotten worse. Let's talk about 
the potential path forward for Ukraine, <clears throat> especially given the fact that we have this U.S. election looming over the crisis. Donald Trump was talking yesterday about Zelensky, saying that he was making nasty aspersions about him. That had to do with this New Yorker article, I'm sure you've seen, but what he said about J.D. Vance, also the fact that he went to Pennsylvania, which is a swing state in this country. Do you think Zelensky miscalculated this political situation right now in the United States? I'm convinced that President Zelensky is ready to work with uh, whoever is uh, elected as uh, president uh, in, in the United States. And I also know that uh, President Zelensky worked with President Trump when he was uh, president of the United States. And also that during that time, actually, the United States uh, increased its uh, military support to Ukraine. Uh, it uh, was during the Trump administration that the decision to provide lead-laid javelins uh, to, uh, to Ukraine was taken. So it's not for me and it's not for President Zelensky to have any opinion uh, about who uh, the American people should elect, but we need to work with whoever is elected to ensure uh, continued support for Ukraine. I guess I'm confused because there's been a change of attitude from President Zelensky. He sat down with me in July and basically said he wanted to get into a room with Trump. He wanted to see the plan Trump had when he says, I have a path to victory. And now he comes here and he's kind of poking the bear. What he says about his running mate and the fact of the matter is Trump is not going to be meeting him along the sidelines mm -hmm. of the U.N. General Assembly. And that probably goes back to what Zelensky has said about him. But, you know, it's not for me as Secretary General of NATO to try to, uh, to facilitate a meeting between uh, President Zelensky and, and, and uh, Donald Trump. Uh, what, uh, what I can do is to... Uh, convey to, uh, to, the, to the United States, to all NATO allies, that it is important that we continue to support uh, Ukraine, because this is uh, not only about Ukraine, it's also about our own security. If we allow President Putin to win in Ukraine, it will be a tragedy for the Ukrainians, but also dangerous for us, because then the message to President Trump is that when he uses military force, he gets what he, uh, to, to President uh, Putin, is that when he uses uh, military force, he gets what he wants. And, uh, and, uh, and that will also be followed very closely in China. Uh, so, so this is not only about Europe, but also about uh, whether we should allow authoritarian leaders in, around the world to use military force to achieve what they want. What I've been hearing from some of my sources in the Trump administration is that they want to do similar to what Trump did in the first round, which was push NATO alliance, <clears throat> push the alliance to have more of a collective defense spending. Basically now they would push for 3%. How would you, um, you know, your advice to the incoming Secretary General on how to deal with that? Well, first of all, I think we need to recognize the enormous progress European allies have made, uh, have made uh, because uh, in, in back in 2014, um, uh, only three uh, allies met the guidelines spending 2% of GDP on defense. Uh, this year, 23 allies uh, are spending 2% or more. Uh, but we also made it clear that 2% is not enough. So the good news is that we have met the 2% uh, uh, target, but we need to do even uh, more. Uh, 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 because um, uh, we live in a more dangerous world, and therefore we agreed uh, at our last summit um, that 2% uh, is a minimum. It's not a ceiling, it's a floor. Uh, and we also have agreed in NATO new defense plans, which require specific capabilities, forces, readiness, and for allies to provide those forces, we have agreed that they should provide, they have to spend uh, significantly more than 2%. Whether that's two and a half or three, I will not give you a exact number, but it's significantly more than two. Do you think that NATO is significantly stronger or significantly weaker than it was when you took the office? There's no doubt that NATO is significantly stronger. Uh, we are spending much more on uh, defense. Uh, we have many more troops on high readiness. We have uh, more high-end capabilities. We have battle-ready troops in the Eastern part of the alliance. But the challenge is that the world is more dangerous. So the success of NATO is that when the world changes, we change. And that's exactly what we have seen. The issue is that NATO <coughs> members may not agree on where the dangers are and exactly how to deal with them. How do you see NATO facing off with certain economic and potential military threats from, say, China? and other countries where it's a little more complicated in terms of the members? Well, we are 32 allies. And of course, sometimes it takes time to make 32 allies representing 50% uh, of the world's GDP, 50% of the world's military might to agree. Uh, but the good news is that on, for instance, China, we have come a very long way. Not so many years ago, NATO didn't have any unified policy on China. Now we have a very clear position that China matters for our security, that uh, China cannot continue 
uh, to enable Russia's war aggression against uh, uh, Ukraine uh, without consequences for its interest and, uh, and reputation. And allies have also agreed that we need to work more closely with our partners in the Indo-Pacific, Japan, uh, South Korea, Australia, as a response to what we see China is doing. We could talk to you all day, but we're running out of time, so I have to squeeze this in. And it's rather selfish. Do you know a guy that might be able to help us set up the show, take it on the road to the Munich Security Conference anytime soon? <laughs> Do you know someone we yeah. might be able to call? But, you know, uh, the Munich Security Conference is a very good platform to discuss security <laughs> issues. Uh, but I will not uh, give you a specific name for okay. who can help with that. I'll get in touch in a number of weeks' time and hopefully <laughs> maybe that will change. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for everything over the last decade. We appreciate it. We Thank really you. do. Thank you. The NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, there. Coming up tomorrow, here's the lineup for you. We'll catch up with Sebastian Page of T. Rowe Price, the former World Bank President, David Malpass, Tom Steyer of Galvanized Climate Solutions, and Christina Campmany of Invesco. Bramo, this market ripping into the opening bell. How many nodes of stimulus can you get from the U.S., from China, potentially the ECB, from Saudi Arabia? It seems to feel a little bit like something that rhymes with Moff Landing something Nirvana. Something like Just need to end some wars. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. That would be perfect. Please. From New York City this morning, good morning. This was Bloomberg Surveillance.